Appendix 100 Chapter 9 Recovered Trace of Two Lost Spheres Rakhtha Two Lunar and Two Solar Spheres 101 Discriminations Hitherto Neglected 102 Difficulty of the Task 103 It should nevertheless be undertaken 103. A long-standing problem in Egyptian cosmology 104. Its solution 107. Chapter 10. Points and problems for future study. The prehistoric world concept 109. Myths as Beginnings of a Philosophy of Nature 110 Why Hard to Understand 112 The Seeming Lack of Harmony Often Unreal 112 Mythical Representations of the World as Axis 113 Also of the Cosmic Water System 115 and of Intermundane Highways 116. The Lunar Sphere is bridged from Underworld to Upper 118. The Zodiac, when invented, and were 119. The answer to these questions becoming clearer 126. Appendix 1. The Model Ablation 133 2 Homer S. Abode of the Dead 157 3 Homer S. Abode of the Living 178 4 The Gates of Sunrise in the Oldest Mythologies 192 5 the Homeland of the Gandharvas 197 6 The World Tree of the Teutons 200 7 Problems Still Unsolved in Indo-Aryan Cosmology 205 V Index of Authors 217 9 Index of Subjects 221 Illustrations Universe of the Ancient Papalonians Fronians 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 Page the Hebrew Universe, drawn by White House 20 The Hebrew Universe, drawn by Schiaparelli 27 The Egyptian Universe as described by Maspero 59 the Egyptian universe is later drawn by M63. The world of Homer 169. Rootage of the Teutonic world tree 203. Original diagrams illustrative of the earth of the Iranians, the earth of the Indo-Aryans, the navel of the earth, the earth of Dante, and the earth of Columbus, are given in cradle of the human race. The diagrams by Whitehouse, Schiaparelli, and Maspero, reproduced in the following pages, are used with the kind permission of their publishers. 9. Preface In the judgment of those who have seen it the following treatise sheds a new light on not a few important questions. It ought to prove helpful to all students of ancient thought, preeminently to all teachers of ancient literatures. It deals with a theme fundamental beyond all others. Back of every religion, and of every philosophy or science worthy of the name, lies a worldview, a concept in which are included all localities and all beings supposed in that religion or philosophy or science to exist. In proportion to its clearness and completeness, it in every case groups and mentally pictures these localities and beings in certain relations to each other, and thus also in their total unity as a universe. 
the science which critically investigates and expands the worldview of any people, or of any system of doctrine, is called cosmology. The branch which does this for a group or class of world concepts is known as comparative cosmology. The present work may be regarded as an introduction to this fascinating study. For more than three decades it has been the duty and the delight of the writer to inquire 11. 12. Preface Into the world concepts of the most ancient peoples of the earth, and to interpret these concepts as clearly as possible to successive classes of eager-minded students. Almost at the very beginning of this comparative study there began to be reached results noticeably divergent from current teachings in various fields of scholarship. Results so illuminative and mutually self-supporting, however, that in the year 1881 one was led to publish a paper entitled The True Key to Ancient Cosmology and Mythical Geography. Eminent scholars, not only in this country but also in Great Britain and on the continent of Europe, welcomed the essay with generous interest and appreciation. In 1885, in a work on the cradle of the human race, further studies in the ancient cosmologies were published on both sides of the Atlantic. A few years later, in the Journal of the American Oriental Society for 1901, one set forth the view of the Babylonian heavens and earth opened to me by the true key. Illustrating it more fully in the same journal for the year 1902, and for the year 1905. Though this new view, pictured in the frontispiece of the present volume, differed Totocello and Tolaterra from all previously presented, it at once received attentive consideration from some of the most authoritative of Assyriological scholars. Three such, all university professors of international reputation, representing respectively Paris, Ox. Preface 13 Ford and Munich eagerly expressed their partial or full endorsement. One of them wrote, Your paper is full of light. One believe you have discovered what was really the orthodox cosmological system of the Babylonians, and at the same time the origin of the Pythagorean system slash so self-evidencing has the new interpretation proved that, in the eight years since it was proposed as a substitute for the various older teachings, not one writer has to my knowledge questioned its complete agreement with ancient Babylonian thought. In this recovered Euphrates worldview my recent pupils have found such assistance toward a ready understanding of the biblical and other ancient cosmologies that they have repeatedly urged me to print more of the comparative studies that have proved helpful to them. So immense, however, is the field, and so fragmentary must be the contribution which any one man can hope to make, that one have hesitated to issue what one have prepared. Almost daily new light is reaching the investigator of prehistoric times and peoples so that any new archaeological deduction is liable to need for its best statement some modification before it can be carried through the press and through the judgment day that awaits every book sufficiently comprehensive to be of interest to many and diverse specialists. In the world of scholars, as elsewhere, however, obligations are mutual. 14. Preface And knowing, as one do, to other pioneers all that one myself have come to see, one cannot refuse to make such return as one may be able. The book has been forty years, one suppose, in the making, but no doubt one could spend forty more upon it and still find each new touch suggesting and demanding yet another. The ten chapters of the work cover all the nations from whose literary remains we can hope for any important light on the world concepts of generations yet earlier. The Chinese are not included, for the reason that as yet the Sinologues have found in Chinese literature no system of cosmology clearly distinguishable from the Buddhistic and manifestly antedating it. Following the lead of my lamented friend, Mr. Perry and Dilaku Perry, an increasing number of scholars are coming to ascribe the beginnings of Chinese civilization to a prehistoric colony of immigrants from the basin of the Euphrates. If this view shall ultimately find general acceptance, it will, of course, be easy to believe that the pre-Buddhistic worldview of this ancient nation, like that of so many others, was identical with that of the Babylonians. 
Cerecthofen, China D8. 1, 404 FE. In an appendix, one have given certain miscellaneous papers pertinent to the general theme. But the most helpful supplement to the discussions presented in the 10 chapters will be Preface 15 Found in the work already mentioned, The Cradle of the Human Race, usually cited by its short title, Paradise Found, of which a new and enlarged edition, the 12th, is nearly ready for the press. One cannot close this foreword without grateful mention of some of the colleagues and friends to whom one am indebted for valued private assistance in the preparation of the pages that follow. Assistance kindly given in personal conference or in correspondence are oftenest of all in both interviews and letters. It must be understood, of course, that the mention commits no one of the name to any of the inferences one have drawn from the information courteously communicated. To obviate the embarrassment of attempting to arrange the list according to the measure of my debt, the alphabetical order is adopted. Professor Philippe Berger, College de France, Paris. Ernest A. Wallace Budge, Lit. D. FSA. British Museum, London. Rev. Professor R. H. Charles, D. D. Trinity College, Dublin. Professor Judson B. Coit, Ph. D. Boston University. Professor T. W. Rhys Davids, Ph. D. L. D. London University. Professor Fritz Hommel, Ph. D. S. T. D. University, Munich. Professor Washburn Hopkins, Ph. D. L. D. Yale University. Professor Herbert A. Howe, A. M. Alfaro Lina. D. University Park, Colorado. Professor A. 5. W. Jackson, L. H. D. L. D. Columbia University. 16. Preface. New York City. Professor Morris Jastro, sure. Ph. D. University of Pennsylvania. Rev. H. W. Johns, Master of Arts, Fellow Queen's College, Cambridge, England. Professor E. Kuhn, Ph. D. University, Munich. Professor Charles Rockwell Lenman, Ph. D. L. D. Harvard University. Professor Ernst Luhmann, Ph. D. University, Strasbourg. Professor Thomas Bond Lindsay, Ph. D. Boston University. Professor David Gordon Lyon, Ph. D. 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 Harvard University. Professor A. A. McDonnell, Ph. D. Director India Institute, Oxford. Professor G. C. Maspero, D. C. L. College de France, Director of Excavations, Cairo, Egypt. Professor H. G. Mitchell, Ph. D. S. T. D. Boston. Professor W. Max Muller, D. D. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Professor Lawrence H. Mills, Master of Arts, D. D. University of Oxford. Director L. 
De Milu. Music I met, Paris. E. W. B. Nicholson, Master of Arts, Librarian Bodleian Library, Oxford. Theophilus Goldridge Pinches, L.D. London University. Professor Archibald H. Says, D. D. L.D. Queen S. College, Oxford. Rev. Jefferson E. Scott, Ph. D. S. T. D. Amar, India. Professor Wilhelm Spiegelberg, Ph. D. University, Strasbourg. Professor E. B. Tyler, L. D. F. R. S. University of Oxford. Rev. William Hayes Ward, D. D. L. D. New York. Professor William Marshall Warren, Ph. D. Boston University. Mrs. Professor George Arthur Wilson, Ph. D. Syracuse University. Preface. 17. As one write these names one am painfully reminded of not a few others equally entitled to appreciative mention, whose honored bearers, no longer with us, have risen to loftier viewpoints in the universe than any we on earth can reach. Ever sacredly cherished shall be their memory. Postscript. Since the foregoing was written drive. H. W. Johns has laid me under new and deeper obligation by carefully reading the entire manuscript of the work and kindly expressing his unqualified approval of its fundamental positions. Boston University WFW Chapter 1 The Hebrew Universe is commonly pictured Under the word cosmogony, in the excellent new dictionary of the Bible edited in five volumes by Drive. James Hastings, may be found a good representation of the Hebrew conception of the universe as ordinarily interpreted. The article is from the pen of Principal C. Whitehouse, and it is illustrated by the diagram here reproduced. Let us examine this picture. In the center of a sea that is limitless in every direction, we are shown a thick circular disk to represent the Earth. Between its upper and lower surfaces there is an hermetically closed cavern to represent Sheol, the general abode of the dead. Around the discus edge on the upper surface there is a ring of very lofty mountains. To this ring there is fitted, all the way round, and by a watertight joint, a huge metallic vault, hemispherical in form. This represents the sky. Heaven and earth do not include the universe, it will be noticed. For below the earth disk, and above the sky vault, in every direction, however far thought may go, there are waters infinite. To aid our comprehension of the deluge narrative certain sluice ways are 19. 20. The earliest cosmologies Represented as extending upward through the Earth's disk, special pains being taken, as of course was necessary, to avoid flooding the shield cavity. In the sky vault certain orifices the universe of the Hebrews according to Whitehouse. A placed and carefully marked windows. Just under the vault on one side there is a ring dot, marked sun, opposite to which are three asterisks denominated stars. Just. White House as Hebrew World. 21. Above these, and, like the others, hugging the vault, is a new, or old, moon, which, with some unexplained perversity, turns her illuminated side away from the sun. All these nocturnal role-players may well account themselves superfluous, 
for to the blazing sun there has been given no discoverable retreat to which he may retire when disposed to leave the field and the hour to his lesser colleagues. What now is the evidence upon which this representation is put before us as a true account of the Hebrew and older Babylonian heavens and earth? Simply a few manifest metaphors torn from their context in the language of the Old Testament poets. Let us hear our interpreter, the Hebrews thought of the world as a disc, chuck, kiesi. Isa. 40. 22. And to this earthly disc corresponded the heavenly disc, also called chuck, kiesi. Job 22. 14. Prov. 8. 27. In this statement he seems inconsistent with himself, for if the earth is a disc, and heaven a disc, it is plain that the latter cannot be, as his diagram represents it, a hemispherical vault or arch dome. Putting the case in another way, we must insist that if, in the passage relating to heaven, he makes Chug mean something spherical or hemispherical, he must, to be consistent, make Chug also mean something spherical or hemispherical when applied to the earth. A little earlier in his article Drive. White House. 22. The earliest cosmologies. Argues as follows. Numerous passages may be cited to prove that the Hebrew Semite regarded the sky as a solid vault or arch dome. In Job 37. 18 it is compared to a firm molten mirror the hue of which in Exod. 24. 10 is described as resembling sapphire, while from Amos 9. 6. Job 26. 10, 11. Prov. 8. 27, 28. We gather the additional details that this solid compacted vault, or arch dome, was supported on the loftiest mountains as pillars, Job 26. 11. It was also provided with windows and gates, Gen. 7. 11. 28. 17. 2 Kings 7. 2.19. Sa. 78. 23. Above this solid rachia, firmament, flowed the upper heavenly waters, Gen. 1. Which descended in rain through these openings, Sa. 104. 3. 148. 4. 2 Kings 7. 19. These precious details, and this precious textual proof of their correctness, seem to have been handed down from editor to editor, with faithful repetition, from the date of the first Bible dictionary ever issued. And not without countenance from the same predecessors, the author assures us that his picture of the Hebrew universe accurately represents the Babylonian as well. For the sake of a change, if nothing more, let us hope that the next writer on this subject will begin with the question of antecedent probability. Nature knows nothing of discs, hardly anything of discoids. A disc is a product. White House's Hebrew World 23 Of measurably advanced art. On the other hand, Primeval men saw spheres and spheroids on every hand. The sun and moon are visible globes. The sand grain and the boulder, the hailstone and the dewdrop, the seeds of grass, the fruit of trees, the egg of bird and beast and fish, the sky which encloses all, and the eye which discerns all, are spheres or spheroids. What's so natural as to think the earth a sphere? What's so unlikely is the supposition that the orbless ancestors of any ancient people ascribed to the Earth the form of the mathematical solid bounded by two parallel circular planes in horizontal position, and the segment of a hollow cylinder in position perpendicular.
American Indians at the time of their discovery were found possessed of the idea that the earth is a ball, why should we not freely ascribe so natural a concept to the ancient Hebrews? It was found even among the savage paddocks of Borneo. Two, but the fair and sufficient criticism to be passed upon all our accepted expounders of Hebrew cosmology is that they fail in thoroughness. By a slightly more extended and thoroughgoing application of their exegetical method they could further show, and with equal cogency, that among the Hebrews the heavens were. Low H. Bancroft, Native Races of the Pacific States, Vol. 3. B. 536. Labama, Frobenius, Die Weltanschauung zur Naturkunde, Weimar, 1898, p. 124. 24. The earliest cosmologies. Thought to contain a supply of wax, or of some similar substance, with which at appropriate times the Almighty sealeth up the stars, Job 9. Also, that the earth was believed to possess at least one year, Isa. 1. 2. Give ear, earth. One would think it time to have done with such wooden literalism as that which we are criticizing. But, unfortunately, even our very latest Encyclopedia Biblica, that edited by Professor Chain, brings us in the cosmographic portions no relief. Our young people are entitled to some better guidance in this field of study. Pending its arrival, the present writer avails himself of the opportunity to renew his profession of faith that both Babylonian and Hebrew thought were adjusted to an earth utterly un like in form, and to a system of heavens above heavens whose composition was as far removed from earthly metals as it was from the silk of goat's hair. 104. 2. And Isa. 40. 22. Despite all that the rehearsers of traditional cosmology say, or rather because of what they say, and because of the inconsistencies in which they continually involve themselves, one long interested student believes that their attempted reconstruction of the Hebrew and earlier Semitic universe is peaceably mistaken, and that the eminent American astronomer, Nukem, is far nearer the truth when he pens this deliberate public statement, not enough credit has been. White House's Hebrew World 25 Given to the ancient astronomers There is no time within the scope of history when it was not known that the Earth is a sphere, and that the direction down, at all points, is toward the same point at the Earth's center. If after the word sphere he had written, or other unsupported solid, he would have stated the exact truth. Soon after the foregoing was written, a distinguished Italian astronomer published a new and improved representation of the Hebrew world, and to a consideration of this we will pass in our next chapter. Chapter 2 The Hebrew Universe as Pictured by Schiaparelli In the year 1903, Drive. G. Schiaparelli, director of the Brera Observatory in Milan, published in Italian a work entitled Astronomy in the Old Testament. The following year a German translation with certain emendations was issued at Gießen. A year later there appeared at Oxford an authorized English translation, with many corrections and additions by the author. In this book of 184 pages we have at the time of this writing the latest published attempt to portray the world concept of the ancient Hebrews. In most respects the work well deserves the warm international welcome so promptly accorded it. It would be exceedingly difficult, one think impossible, to find another astronomer as skilled in Old Testament studies, or an Old Testament scholar by profession equally distinguished in astronomy. The only really weak chapter in the book is the second, the one relating to the Old Testament cosmos as a whole, and even here there are some improvements on the corresponding points in the interpretations criticized in our opening chapter. 26. Schiaparelli as Hebrew World 27. 
The author S. Kirk representing the Hebrew universe, with his accompanying explanations, is here reproduced. D. Heaven, the earth, and the abysses. According to the writers of the Old Testament. Schiaparelli. Explanatory key. ABS equals the upper heaven. AT equals the curve of the abyss. AT equals the plane of the earth and seas. ERS equals various parts of the sea. E equals various parts of the earth. GOG equals the profile of the firmament or lower heaven. K equals the storehouses of the winds. L the storehouses of the upper waters, of snow, and of hail. M equals the space occupied by the air, within which the clouds move. N equals the waters of the great abyss. X equals the fountains of the great abyss. P equals Sheol or Limbo. Q, the lower part of the same, the inferno properly so called. On this illustrative picture it must be remarked in the way of friendly criticism that while, on page 38, the author speaks of it as representing the total universe as conceived of by the Old Testament writers, it in reality. 28. The earliest cosmologies omits all the heavenly bodies. It is therefore simply a picture of the earth and its immediate belongings. On another page the author himself incidentally refers to it as representing the central and immovable part of the universe. A part is never the whole. Where is the moon which was made to rule the night? And where the sun, which our author describes as the most magnificent work of the Almighty? Where are Arcturus and his sons, the bands of Orion, the Pleiades with their sweet influences? Where are the innumerable stars which God showed to Abraham, promising him that like them his seed should be innumerable? Did no Hebrew ever notice the Milky Way and account it a part of the universe of God? We really cannot consent to think of Job and David and Isaiah as having been lifelong prisoners under a firmament which, as described in all seriousness by an American divine as late as in 1899, was like a brass dome, or cover, beaten out, and shut down around the edge of the earth like the cover of a dinner platter. Schiaparelli by no means denies to the ancient Hebrews a knowledge of the heavenly bodies, but his diagram, though professedly including heaven, contains no hint of them. His firmament is some improvement on the brass one just referred to, for he is careful to state that it is transparent, allowing the light of Schiaparelli's Hebrew World 29 The stars to pass through But it is still a Vault of great solidity it still has in all literalness floodgates, or portcullises, and rain can fall only when these are opened. In fact, he states that the main duty of this solid firmament is to support the upper waters, holding them suspended on high, above the earth, and separated from the lower waters of the continents and seas and abysses. Moreover, as he well adds, considering the spherical and convex shape of the firmament, the upper waters could not remain above without a second wall to hold them in at the sides and at the top. So a second vault above the vault of the firmament closes in, together with the firmament, a space, the space marked L in his diagram. Instead, therefore, of drive. White House's celestial ocean upheld by the firmament above the sun, moon, and stars, our present interpreter gives us a celestial tank, situated somewhat below the sun, moon, and stars, but bottomed by the firmamental vault of great solidity, and topped by a second vault of like character. For one one strongly suspect that King Solomon would have betrayed some disturbance of mental serenity had a wise man from the west appeared at his court and presented this diagram of the cosmical water system, intimating, no matter how politely, that it represented the cosmology taught in the schools of Jeru. 30. The Earliest Cosmologies 
Salem and believed in by her reigning king. If not too impatient, he very likely would have asked some embarrassing questions. For example, How is it that this firmament of yours is pervious to the winds stored up in K, but impervious to the waters stored up in L? Again, if these upper waters require for their support a vault of great solidity, how is it that they do not immediately rush down to GG, causing the air confined in K to rise and gather in the space between an H? If such a downrush of the waters is prevented by a metallic partition welded watertight to each of the two vaults all the way round at the base of the supported waters, in what one of our Hebrew authors, wise man of the West, did you find it mentioned? And what name was given to so important a part of the world as structure? Look you would such a wise man from the West have been if the incensed king had courteously forborn to apply to him one or more of the mordant remarks ascribed to the royal pen in the book of Proverbs. But, surmises apart, who does not find it exceedingly difficult to understand how our author can quote, as he does, such Old Testament passages as the following, when the clouds are full, they spread rain over the earth, his own translation of Echo. 11. The clouds drop water, judge. 5. He draweth up the drops of water which distill. Schiaparelli S. Hebrew World. 31. In rain. And drop upon men abundantly, Job 36. 27. And still give us this traditional overhead water tank notion as a just representation of Old Testament ideas on the subject of rain production. One that our author should have found a firmament of great solidity necessary as a support for the upper waters, and a second firmament above that needed to keep the waters from flowing off the convexity of the first, is the more remarkable, since in two cases, discussed in the very same chapter, he ascribes to the Hebrews a naive acceptance of an original divine decree or a continuous exercise of God's omnipotent will as an all-sufficient explanation for that which would seem to be a more striking violation of this same law of gravitation. The first is the case of the supposed feeding of mountain springs from the sea, which Schiaparelli insists was considered as occurring through subterranean channels only. Respecting this he says, that the lower waters should overcome the laws of natural gravity, and rise again from subterranean depths to the surface, was considered as a result of the omnipotence of God, Amos 5. This is on one. Hebrew scholars do not all agree that by the waters above the firmament, Gen. 1. Rainwater is meant. Hill, for example, argues through more than 30 pages that in the mind and meaning of the sacred writer the upper waters were the primordial substrate out of which the sun, moon, and other planets were formed. Teichhoff Teffungsgeschichte, Basel, 1861, p. 352-388 This uncertainty as to the meaning of the very term under discussion is overlooked by most interpreters. 32. The Earliest Cosmologies Page 29 On page 27 we have the second case, that of the Earth, which he says, has no need of a base or support outside of itself, for although all the Massachusetts of the earth, including the lower waters, is suspended in space and rests upon nothing, its remaining so suspended was to the Hebrew mind sufficiently accounted for by the one thought that the whole mundane system was simply fixed unalterably by the divine will. One cannot help wondering how our author would explain why the divine will was considered so much more efficacious below the earth than above it, and why, if the lower waters had no need of support, the upper ones could be kept up in their place only by a material arch of great solidity. May we not also ask him, and the whole array of traditional cosmologists, how they know that the Hebrews did not think of the waters under the earth as vaporous, and as usually vaporized to the point of invisibility like the corresponding waters above the earth. 
even in the days when exiled. 20. 4 was written human thought had some degree of self-consistency. Chapter 3. The Babylonian universe newly interpreted asterisk 1. Few studies in ancient cosmology can more entertain or instruct the investigator of two day than a careful comparison of the seven diagrams published as correct pictures of the Babylonian universe in the works named below, 2345670 of the seven agree. Moreover, the first represents the zodiac as at a vast distance above the sphere of the fixed stars, a proceeding which at the start disarranges all ordinary astronomic ideas. Equally UN picturable in my imagination is the seventh of the series, The World Sketched by Redo. Again and again have one tried to construct it in thought, but every time have failed. Even Jensen in his great work gives us for the place of the convocation of the gods, to Isaac. 1. This chapter was printed in the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society for October, 1908, and by courteous consent of the Council of that body is here reproduced. 2. The reader is earnestly requested to turn to these diagrams and to note their striking divergences. 1. Isaac Meyer, Kabbalah, Phil. 1888, p. 448. 2. Hommel, Babylonischer Ursprung der Ägyptischen Kultur, 1892, p. 8. 3. Hommel, und Dabend Lungen, 1901, th. 3, 347. 4. Jensen, Cosmologie der Babylonier, 1890, Appendix. 5. Maspero, Dawn of Civilization, 1892, p. 543. 6. White House, Article Cosmogony, Hastings, Dictionary of the Bible. 7. Hugo Redo, The Creation Story of Genesis, 1902, p. 56. Professor Hommel a second is a marked improvement on his first. In connection with it he prints a generous reference to the present writer. 33 34 The earliest cosmologies Only a pitch-dark cavern in the thin crust of his sea-filled hemispherical earth, and has no place for Hades but another cavern located in the same thin crust and oddly enough far above the cave of the gods. One surely there is a call for new attempts to think the thoughts of these ancient Semites after them. For the reconstruction of the Babylonian universe we have no less than 12 most valuable data derived from the study of ancient Babylonian texts. These will now be enumerated, and that the enumeration may command the greater confidence one shall connect with each of them one or more references to equivalent statements by experts of high authority in this field. Here follow the data. 1. In the Babylonian conception of the universe the Earth occupied the central place. Winkler expressly calls the Earth the accepted center of the planetary system of this people too. 2. The northern half of the Earth was viewed as the upper, the southern as the under. The former was associated with light and life, the latter with darkness and death. Winkler remarks, the south and the underworld are identical. 1. Jensen's diagram, anglicized in terminology and much enlarged, may be seen in Worcester as Genesis in the Diet of Modern Knowledge, opposite page 109. 2. Himmels und Welterbe der Billionier als Grundlage der Weltanschauung und Mythology Ali Volker, von Drive. Hugo Winkler, Leipzig, 1901, p. 34. Identischist also stied an undone to wealth all higher we buy answer a cosmischen Ausrichtung der Docks. 
P twenty four The Babylonian Universe thirty five three The upper and northern half of the Earth was regarded as consisting of seven stages to Pukati, ranged one above another in the form of a staged pyramid. Speaking of the stage temple of Nippur, Sais observes, it was a model of the earth, which those who built it believed to be similarly shaped, and to have the form of a mountain whose peak penetrated the clouds. 4. In like manner the Antarctic or under half of the earth was supposed to consist of seven stages corresponding to those of the upper half. As Jensen expresses it, the seven tupukati of the underworld are a facsimile of the seven tupukati of the overworld. 5. Like the quadrilateral temples modeled. 1. Gifford Lectures, London, 1903, p. 374. See also Boscoen, in the Oriental and Biblical Journal, Chicago, 1884, p. 118. For interesting parallels see W. R. Letherby, Architecture, Mysticism, and Myth, London, 1892. The existence in Egypt of a type of pyramid with sloping stages, and the clear traces in India of a conception of the Earth as spheroidal in figure despite a series of rising zones or retreating mountain terraces upon its surface, suggest that the stages of the Babylonian Earth should not be mentally pictured as necessarily implying their possession of the sharply angular outline presented by a stage temple or by the figure in our diagram. It is quite possible that in Babylonian thought the quadrangularity of the earth was largely a conscious and deliberate emphasizing of the cardinal points of the heavens and earth, and that its pyramidal form and architecture was as conscious and deliberate a deviation from supposed reality as are with us the parallel meridians and flat zones of inner Mercator's of the earth. Moreover, as the celestial spheres are of a substance so crystalline as to be absolutely invisible to men, so the rising stages of the earth are to be viewed as less and less grossly material, until at length all appearance of materiality vanishes, leaving the highest as invisible, save in the case of a divinely sent trance, Gen. 28. 12. As are the heavens in which they are lost. 2. Die Cosmologie der Babylonier, Strasbourg, 1890, p. 175. 36. The earliest cosmologies. After it, the earth of the Babylonians was four-cornered. In this particular it agreed with the conception ascribed to the ancient Egyptians, Hebrews, Chinese, and to the Indorians of the Rigveda period, 1-6. In Babylonian thought, Winkler says, there were seven heavens and seven hells slash this belief is one of untraceable antiquity. Writing on this subject, Homo remarks, the idea of the seven heavens seems to go back to the beginnings of Semitic culture. 4. 7. Above the seventh heaven was another, the highest heaven, that of the fixed stars. Called by the Babylonians the heaven of Anu, after the name of the oldest and highest of their gods. 8. The safe heaven was divided by the zodiac into two corresponding portions, an upper, or arctic, and an under, or antarctic. At the pole of the former Anu had his palace and throne. 5. 1. Sais, Locke. Sit. Also in Cytopsidia Biblica, 2, Col. 1148. C. Puini in Revista Geograph. Eitel. 1895, p. 12. H. W. Wallace, The Cosmology of the Rig Veda, London, 1887, p. 112. F. L. Pohl. Cartographia Delta India, 1901, p. 18. 2. Was die Oberwelt hat, hat auch die Inter. 
Is cheap dem next seepin himmel and seepin hall and odor alal and stuffin. Pop. Sit. B. 34. Also e. Biskoff, Babylonish Estrails Welt Bild, etc. Leap. 1907, p. 28, 29, 34, 36, 40, 104, 156, 161. Free die astronomy der Alten Schalder. In Osland, 1891, p. 381. 4. Winkler, p. 34. Also a. Jeremias, Das Alte Testament in Lich de Alten Orients, Leipzig, 1904, p. 10. 5. Winkler, p. 36. Jensen, p. 24. A. Jeremias, p. 27. Der Sitz in US ist der Nordlich von Tecre Gelagin Himmel mit dem Nordpol de Himmels als Mittelpunkt. Dort ist sein Tron. The Babylonian Universe. 37. 9. In Babylonian thought the North Pole of the Heavens was the true zenith of the cosmic system, and the axis of the system upright. Consequently, as among the ancient Egyptians and Indo-Aryans, the diurnal movements of the sun and moon were regarded as occurring in a horizontal plane. Speaking of the Babylonians, Maspara says, the general resemblance of their theory of the universe to the Egyptian theory leads me to believe that they, no less than the Egyptians, for a long time believed that the sun and moon revolved around the earth in a horizontal plane. 10. Proceeding outward from the central earth, the order of the seven known planets was as follows, Moon, Sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, two that their respective distances from the Earth were not uniform was already known. Such at least seems to be the opinion of Winkler, and certainly is that of Hamel, 311. In order to pass from the upper half of the Earth to its under half, that is, from the abode of living men to the abode of the dead, it was necessary to cross a body of water which on every side separated the two abodes. 1. Dawn of Civilization, p. 544. P.S.C. Robert Spence Hardy, Legends and Theories of the Buddhists, London, 1866, p. 85-89. L. A. Waddell, The Buddhism of Thibet, 1895, p. 78. 2. Winkler, p. 35. Hommel calls it Diaralti Fest Anard Nun. Ofts and Abend Langen, 3, 375, 383. 3. C. Winkler, p. 34. In Immigrosserum Absten von der Erd is the language of Hommel in his Inset der Steigen, p. 38. 38. The earliest cosmologies. This explains the language of drive. A. Jeremy is where he says, when one sails out upon the ocean, one finally comes down into the underworld. 12. According to Diodorus Siculus 231, the Babylonians considered that 12 designated stars south of the zodiac stood in the same relation to the dead as do the 12 corresponding stars north of the zodiac to men still in the land of the living. This representation clearly makes the living and the dead the residents respectively of antipodal surfaces of one and the same heaven enclosed earth. In like manner, in the creation tablets, 5, line 8, Anu and Ear antipodally located gods, the former having his palace and throne at the north pole of the heavens, the latter his palace and throne at the south pole, two such, then, according to latest scholarship, 
are the fundamental features of the ancient Babylonian world concept. The task of combining them is simple. One can but wonder that there should have been such mistakes and such delay in effecting the due adjustment. In the diagram prefixed as a frontispiece to this volume each requirement of the 12 1 of d p 10 also his whole and parodies by den babylonier der alte orient jerb 1 heft s 14 fe also, F. Jeremias, Enchant Pi de la Sauce S. Lairbuk der Digestect, 2 D. Ed. 1905, D. Ed. 1, 275. Teal, Histoire de Endens Religions, P. 177. 2. Winkler, Altorientalisch Forschungen, Leipzig, 1902, P. 201. The Babylonian Universe. 39. Enumerated propositions is fully met. The upright central line represents the polar axis of the heavens and earth in perpendicular position. The two central seven-staged pyramids represent respectively the upper and lower halves of Eker, the earth. The seven dotted half circles above the Earth represent the seven heavens of the planets. The corresponding hemispheres below the Earth, the seven hells. The outermost sphere, the upper half cut away, is where the seven heavens, to show the interior of the system, is of course the all including starry sphere, the sphere girdled by the many mansion zodiac, one and made scintillant by the appointed astral watchers who keep their patient vigils one half above the living, one half above the antipodal dead. How wonderful a worldview was this! How perfect the symmetries of the system! Its duplex center lived on in Pythagorean thought as Earth and Counter-Earth. Doubtless it influenced Plato when in the time as he said, to Earth, then, let us assign the form of a cube. It still lives on in the four-cornered Earth of the New Testament, and in that of the Mohammedan teaching. Its heavens! The lunar mansions of astrology are all within the zodiac. The often misunderstood. And the ever. Of. O. F. Grub. Die. Cosmisch Sistine der Griechen, Berlin, 1851, p. 82. Correctly understood by Cicero, Task. This 1, 28, 68. The double earth of ancient Egyptian cosmography is another parallel. 40. The earliest cosmologies lived on in the homocentric crystalline spheres of the Greek astronomers, and through the influence of Ptolemy S. Almagest shaped the thinking of all savants, philosophers, and poets till the days of Copernicus. Dante's heavens are those of Ptolemy, and Ptolemy's are those of the ancient worshippers of Anu and Sin. Their music is still audible, their form still visible, in Milton's Ode to the Nativity. But while the presence of this highly mathematical world concept is thus traceable through millenniums, its origin was among a people antedating the Babylonians. A truer name, therefore, for the system would be the pre-Babylonian. The East Semites received it from their predecessors in the possession of the Euphratian Valley, the Akkadu Sumerians. At least such is the opinion and the teaching of our highest experts, one did the system originate among these non-Semitic predecessors in the valley. This has been assumed, but no man can pretend to know. 1 I, Zimran, die Keelans Griffin und das Alte Testament, 3. Awful. 1902 S. 349 Chapter 4 The Biblical, Rabbinical, and Quranic Universe in the Light of the Babylonian 
In the opening chapters of this book we saw good reason to challenge the correctness of the commonly accepted representation of the Hebrew heavens and earth. May not the now-recovered Babylonian worldview help us to a better understanding of the conception which underlies the thought and language of the Old and New Testament writers? To my mind the strongest argument in favor of the current representation, and therefore the strongest assignable reason for denying that the biblical universe was substantially identical with the Babylonian, is found in those biblical passages in which, as in the account of Korah and his company, Num. 16. 31, 32, the earth is represented as opening her mouth and engulfing living men, who then are declared to have gone down alive into Sheol. Such language harmonizes so well with the idea that Sheol is an underground cavern, to be reached only through a rift in the overarching earth crust, that White House and Schiaparelli and the rest seem for the moment justified in their depictions. As in 41. 42. The earliest cosmologies. Argument, however, such passages have little weight. In the first place, it is plain that a rift through the solid earth of the Babylonians would as effectually carry engulfed men into the underworld as would a somewhat shorter rift through the upper half of the hollow disk like earth presented as by White House in Schiaparelli. In the second place, if Sheol was really believed to be an enormous cavern in the bowels of the earth, reached in Korah's case by an extemporized entrance, where was the ordinary and normal entrance for Korah's countrymen in general? Barbarians have been known to point out cave mouths supposed by them to lead to an underworld, but no biblical writer has a hint respecting any such earth-piercing path divinely provided for all ghosts descending to Sheol. Granting the existence of such a path, where was its upper end, its intransigate? In the territory of which tribe was the uncanny rift, the rendezvous of all the newly dead? If it was beyond the bounds of the Holy Land, to what unhallowed hidden land were the pious and unpious ghosts of Israel compelled to journey in search of the tunnel mouth through which they could hope to reach their long home and be gathered to their fathers? Such questions need no answer. They belong to a world utterly foreign to Hebrew thought. Biblical, Rabbinical, and Quranic. 43. Possibly someone will deny the need of any such tunnel in the case of ghosts, and claim that according to Hebrew belief the disembodied spirit in the moment of its disembodiment received power to penetrate the soil and the unrifted rock overarching the shield cavity. But this is to go quite beyond the evidence. Nowhere do the biblical writers claim or imply that solid material barriers impose no limitations upon the free movements of a disembodied human spirit. Furthermore, in case the soil and every part of the solid earth were as freely traversable by disembodied human spirits as the present supposition implies, the need of any cavern for the assembled and assembling spirits in the heart of the earth would be quite done away. Matter-filled space would be as available as any other. Asterisk in the third place, the most ancient known pictures of a human soul after separation from the body represent it as wind and bird-like, one illustrations in Egyptian art are numberless. Babylonian texts imply the same representation. In perfect accord with this idea are the words found in the psalm traditionally considered the oldest and most impressive in the Bible, the 90th, wherein we read that our fleeting life is soon cut off, but as soon as it is. 1 C.G. Weicker, Der Sedenved in Der Alien Literar und Kunst. An Mythologisch Archaeologisch in Tersachum. Myth 103 Abudungen im Text. Leipzig, 1907. 44. The Earliest Cosmologies. Cut off we fly away. Verily, wings were a strange equipment for penetrating the geologic strata beneath our feet. Finally, if we may trust the exegesis of the Apostle Paul, his countrymen, like the Babylonians, considered a passage across the ocean the same thing as a descent to the deep abodes of the dead. A Comparison of Dut. 30.
Eleven, thirteen, with Ram. Ten. Six, eight, shows that he interprets the one transit as the perfect equivalent of the other. One, one, a word may be expected touching Reikia, the term translated, or as many have already said, mistranslated, in Gen. One, by the term firmament. It would require a book many times larger than the entire Pentateuch to contain all that biblical scholars have written in attempted explanation of the word. Did it really mean to the writer the visible sky conceived of as a solid material vault constructed to support, or to keep back the waters of the heavenly ocean? Most have said, yes. But many know. Schiaparelli, as we have seen, pictures the structure as double, so also does Redo. But while Schiaparelli makes both faults celestial in location, Redo makes one celestial, but the other its subterrestrial counterpart, the creation story of Genesis, p. 51 FE. Most interpreters have described the Reikia as a solid. Some, however, have claimed that it should be conceived of as a fluid. Some, like Basil, seem to describe it as of a substance altogether impalpable and supersensible. M. Mitchell translates it vacuity, and understands it to mean the vacuity resulting from the separation of the parts of the nebula out of which the solar system was formed and their aggregation around the different planetary centers and their common center, the astronomy of the Bible, p. 190f. A German contemporary of his, Professor J. H. Kurtz of Dorpat, created much discussion by arguing at length, in his book on Bible and Astronomy, 1853, in favor of identifying Reikia with the atmospheric air enveloping our planet. Long before him, however, an English physician, Drive. Samuel Pye, in his Mosaic Theory of the Solar or Planetary System, 1766, had gone yet farther in this direction, and had paraphrased Gen. 1. 6, 7 as follows, And God said, Let there be a firmament, an expanse, an atmosphere, in the midst of the waters, that are upon the surface of the earth, and of every primary planet, and the waters that by means of these atmospheres will be raised and suspended above the waters on their surfaces. And let it, on each of them, divide the waters from the waters. And God made Biblical, Rabbinical, and Quranic 45 Passing now from negative considerations to the question, what view of the universe was held by the writers of the Old and New Testament? Six points of fundamental import should be noted. First Inasmuch as the Hebrews were younger kinsmen of the East Semites and their tribal territories in Canaan long under earlier Babylonian influence, and Inasmuch as their earliest calendrical terms and adjustments, such as the firmament or expanse, an atmosphere, to the earth, to every other planet, and comet. And, as exhalations proceed from the surface of its body, to the sun itself. And divided the waters, a fluid matter, which were under the firmament, from the waters, a fluid matter, which were above the firmament, on each of them, and it was so, he. 12, 13. Besides the above interpretations, one have seen it described as a line, a circle, a plate, a worldwide surface without thickness, a region, the first, the third, or again the eighth of the Ptolemaic spheres, and so on. In 1904, Drive. A. Jeremias, in Das Alte Testament in Ditch de Alten Orients, p. 78, identified the Reikia with the Zodiac, Tecre, but in his second edition, 1906, he inclines to favor Winkler a slightly published view, Forschengen, 3, 387, according to which the total of realm, Erdrich, is, or rather was, before the priestly writer forgot himself and got his ideas mixed, the Reikia separating the upper and the underwaters. This somewhat resembles Radoa's view. From a reference in Jeremias, one infer that something analogous is to be found in J. Lepsius, Das Wright Christi, p. 227 f. 1903, 
a work which one have not seen. If any reader is unable to content himself with a free choice from among the foregoing interpretations, he has still an alternative remaining, for in three differently edited editions of the article in Smith's Dictionary of the Bible, Subvos, it is solemnly stated that the rakia is a species of power, and, despite Gen. 1. One which should be carefully distinguished from the heavens, the former being the upheaving power, the latter the upheaved body in the same article, strange to say, the same writer describes this identical rakia as that in which they, the sun, moon, and stars, are fixed as nails, and from which consequently they might be said to drop off, he say. 14. 12. A fast-setting sun, fixed as a nail in the upheaving power of the heavens, would certainly be an interesting object for contemplation. The advent of E. W. Maunder's Astronomy of the Bible, 1908, permits us to hope that a new and better day is dawning. 46. The Earliest Cosmologies Names of the months, the beginning of the year, etc., were of Euphratian origin. There is a strong antecedent probability that their astronomic and cosmologic ideas also were directly or indirectly derived from the Babylonians, or from the ancestors of both peoples, and corresponded to the Euphratian. One second. The Hebrew use of a plural term for the heavens, sometimes intensified to the heaven of heaven slash precisely corresponds with the immemorial Babylonian usage, and implies in the thought of the Hebrew writers a plurality of heavens. Professor Salmond, after a recent examination of the whole question, wrote, in view of the evidence, the most reasonable conclusion is that the conception of the heavens which pervades the Old Testament and the New, not accepting the Pauline writings, though St. Paul mentions only the third heaven and paradise, is that of a series of seven heavens. Third. The biblical references to the four comers, you, of the earth slash and cognate expressions, imply a conception of the earth corresponding in this particular to the body. For an excellent estimate of the influence of Babylonia on Israel, see Robert William Rogers, The Religion of Babylonia and Assyria, New York, 1908, p. 92 FE 140 FE At Basim 2 Hastings, Dictionary of the Bible, 2, 334 Writing of Paradise, the same author says, there is abundant evidence that the belief in a plurality of heavens prevailed among the Jews. But it is doubtful whether it was a belief in a threefold heaven. The evidence is rather to the effect that the prevailing, if not the only, conception among the Jews of our Lord as time was that of a sevenfold heaven. Hastings, 3, 671. Biblical, Rabbinical, and Quranic. 47. Ionian as above interpreted. Even the new earth in the apocalypse is in the form of a four-square terraced city, whose length and breadth and height are equal, Rev. 21. 16. Fourth. The Old and New Testament passages that contrast the depth of Sheila Hades with the height of the heavens, and those which speak of the kingdom of the heavens, or of Christ as having passed through the heavens, or of whom as being made higher than the heavens, not to speak of others, acquire a new interest and a new pertinency the moment they are interpreted in harmony with the cosmological views first discoverable among the ancient Babylonians, but later, with only trifling modifications, current in the teachings of all the historically known Hellenic astronomers, one-fifth. The already noticed equation of an oversea voyage, Jude. 30. 11, 13, and a descensus ad in Pharos, Rom. 10. 6, 8, is no slight indication that in Hebrew thought the relation of the upper to the underworld was precisely the same as in the Babylonian. So in Job 38, 16, 17, the uninterrupted passage of the poet has thought from the recesses of the sea to the one on the essentially Babylonian homoentric spheres of Pythagoras, Parmenides, Eudoxus, Calippus, Plato, Aristotle, 
and the rest, C.J.L.E. Dreyer, History of Planetary Systems from Thales to Kepler, Cam. 1906, p. 21, 36, 87, 178, 188, 257, 259, 279, 289, 298 FE. S. Oppenheim, Das Astronomische Dotbild im Wandel der Zeit, Leap. 1906. Trollsland, Himsbild und Dudenschang im Wand der Zeit, Tu Leap. 1906. 48. The earliest cosmologies. Gates of death may well be another indication of this habitual association of the two realms, just as in Homeric thought the realm of AIDS ever borders upon that of Poseidon. 1. 6. Philo of Alexandria, the most distinguished contemporary of Jesus among Jewish teachers, born B.C. 20, regarded the universe as made up of the seven concentric planetary spheres, together with the all-including eight sphere, and the central earth around which all revolved, to on the whole, then, there are excellent reasons for believing that the universe of the Old and New Testament writers, like that of the earliest traceable Semites, was not of the dish and cover pattern, but rather of the old upright axled and polyuranian type. Professor Salman goes so far as to say, the evidence is all in favor of the affirmative, that is, in favor of the opinion that the conception of a series of heavens is found in the scriptures. Then he adds, but the evidence which bears out the existence of the idea of a plurality of heavens also favors the idea of a sevenfold series of heavens. A study of the apocryphal literature only reinforces the evidence. Take for an example the Slavonian Book of the Secrets of Enoch. Robert Henry Charles. 1 see also Job 26. 5. Sir. 69. 15. And Jonah 2. 2. 6. 2. See James Tremendous article on Philo in Hastings, Dictionary of the Bible, Extra Volume, p. 200. 3. Hastings, Dictionary of the Bible, 2, p. 321, 322. Biblical, Rabbinical, and Quranic. 49. Everywhere recognized as the foremost authority on this newly discovered work, remarks, the detailed account of the seven heavens in this book has served to explain difficulties in Old Testament conceptions of the heavens, and has shown beyond the reach of controversy that the sevenfold division of the heavens was accepted by St. Paul, and by the author of the epistle to the Hebrews, and probably in the book of Revelation. The ancient apocryphal treatise known as the Ascension of Isaiah describes each of the seven heavens with no less particularity. Passing to authentic rabbinical literature we find the counterpart to all this. That is to say, a clear recognition of the sevenfold division of the space below the earth. And, as in the Babylonian conception, so also in the rabbinical, each underworld as one descends is vaster than the last. And as in the Indorian conception the South Polar demons spend half the year in darkness and half in the blaze of the sun, too so in the rabbinical the occupants of the lowest hell have as torments alternating heat and cold, each six months in duration. This, of course, helps to identify the location of the rabbinical inferno as at one of the terrestrial poles. In all descriptions of such, one in Hastings, Dictionary of the Bible, 1, 711. See also, Charles, The Book of the Secrets of Enoch, p. Excalvi. To the Cradle of the Human Race, p. 199. 50. The Earliest Cosmologies. Regions we are apt to meet with details and amplifications more or less fantastic, and in the present case they are not lacking. 
The Jalkut Rabeni, for example, gives the following, the seven abodes of Sheil are very spacious. And in each there are seven rivers of fire and seven rivers of hail. The uppermost abode is sixty times less than the second, and thus the second is sixty times larger than the first, and every abode is sixty times larger than that which precedes it. In each abode are seven thousand caverns, and in each cavern seven thousand clefts, and in each cleft seven thousand scorpions. Each scorpion hath seven limbs, and on each limb are one thousand barrels of gall. There are likewise seven rivers of rankest poison, which when a man toucheth he bursteth. And the destroying angels judge him and scourge him every moment, half the year in the fire, and half the year in the hail and snow. And the cold is more intolerable than the fire. 2. It hardly need be added that the heavens of rabbinical tradition were seven, free and that in the rabbinical point of view, the superb. 1. Chehenna, as well as Sheol, has seven departments, one beneath the other. The Jewish Encyclopedia of Vol. V. 217. But in the Chronicles of Yeramil Sheol is the highest and Gehinnom the lowest of the seven divisions of the one underworld. Castor S. Translation, London, 1899, p. 38. 2. Eisenmeiner, Entdeckt Studentum, Vol. 2, p. 345, English Translation, Vol. 2, p. 52. Eisenmeiner, Op. TD 1 460. See also notes of Wettstein, Adam Clark, or Stanley on two corner. 12 2 American Journal of Theology, January 1908, p. 99. Biblical, Rabbinical, and Quranic. 51. Throne of King Solomon, with the six steps leading up to it, was a symbol of the highest heaven with the throne of the eternal above the six inferior heavens, 1 Kings 10. 18, 20. L. In the rabbinical descriptions of the heavens and hells one striking feature has often caused remark. The two regions are said to adjoin or touch each other, Shuish Encyclopedia, X, 517. But if the abode of God is almost infinitely above our earth, and the abode of the lost is far below, how can the two be said to join? In this many writers have found only contradiction and absurdity. A glance at our diagram of the pre-Babylonian universe removes every difficulty and reveals entire consistency of thought. By showing that the heavens and hells are simply the upper and nether halves of the earth enclosing spheres of the universe, the diagram gives optical demonstration that each heaven and each corresponding hell must be in mutual contact at every point of their equatorial junction too. 1. McClintock and Strong, Cyclopedia, Vol. If, P. 122. 2. One other feature in rabbinical cosmography has much perplexed modern investigators. Many writers have referred to it. Among others just lately drive. A. Cherimia's in his at Eo, 2 D. Ed. P. 557M. From Baba Bafra, 2, 25b, he quotes the following, but has no explanation to offer, the sky surrounds the earth like Exodra, encircling three sides, but not the north side. And people explain this by saying, on that side there is no sky. 1. E. It is open, the sky has a hole in it. So long as we conceive of the four cardinal points of the compass as lying in the plane of our own level horizon, a statement of this kind is, of course, an insoluble enigma. On the other hand, 
the moment we adjust north and south to the zenith and nadir of the heavens, as did the ancient Semites, the reason is perfectly clear why in the sky visible to the Hebrews and 52. The earliest cosmologies. Should any reader desire further light upon this particular worldview, he is recommended to turn to the article entitled Hebrew Visions of Hell and Paradise slash printed in the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain in the volume for the year 1893. Therein the author, M. Gaster, Ph. D. Translates for the first time into English a number of ancient texts in some of which Moses is represented as by God's permission and help making a tour of inspection through the seven heavens, the hells and paradise. Wonderful regions are found and beings of incredible dimensions, one closely related to the rabbinical world concept is that of the Quran and of the accepted expounders of the Quran. This can occasion no surprise to anyone who considers the extent to which the Quran is a refecimento of rabbinical ideas and traditions. The hells are. Orifes should be said to be in the north and nowhere else. There only could an opening afford a permanent passage from earth to the heavenly regions. Asterisk A. Winch gives a still more recent demonstration of our thesis in Exorint Lux 2, 1906, p. 113, 168. Just after the above was written Drive. Eric Beskoff published his admirable treatise, Babylonish Estrails and Welt Bild der Thalmud und Midrash, Leipzig, 1907. Therein, p. 39, 40. He refers to the close neighborhood of heaven and hell in the rabbinical teaching and explains it precisely as one have suggested above. Had he represented the upper and lower halves of the earth as antipodal counterparts, as he does the two heaven halves, he would have escaped his difficulty in harmonizing the telluric hell with the cosmic one, confessed on key. 39. Moreover, had Aureli in his criticism of Biskoff, feel. Literature Zeting, 1905 Air. 24. Understood and explained the terraced form of the sky piercing Babylonian earth, he might much more easily have come to an agreement with him as to the unreasonness of tracing so remarkable a Semitic conception to India, and to seven vegetation stufen de Himalaya, p. 156 m. Biblical, Rabbinical, and Quranic. 53. 7. And their names, with references to Quranic passages, may be seen in Professor Palmer's introduction to his translation of the Quran, p. Lex, or in U.S. Dictionary of Islam, Article Hell. To the heavens are also seven. And if they had been a series of seven visible platforms connected by marble stairways, the lowest of the platforms resting on the summit of Mount Sinai and the highest standing high above the highest clouds, they could hardly have been pictured more realistically in the thought of the faithful. How perfectly acquainted with the supernal regions the naive believer felt himself to be, is well seen in the accepted account of Mohammed's ascent to the seventh, and of his repeated passages up and down between the sixth and seventh. In the Miskato Masbe the story is told as follows. Whilst one was sleeping upon my side, Gabriel came to me, and cut me open from my breast to below my navel, and took out my heart, and washed the cavity with zamzam water, and then filled my heart with faith and science. After this, a white animal was brought for me to ride upon. Its size was between that of a mule and an ass, and it stretched as far as the eye could see. The name of the animal was Barak. Then one mounted the animal, and ascended until we arrived at the lowest one. Use adds, for most of these circumstances relating to hell and the state of the damned, Mohammed was in all probability indebted to the Jews and, in part, to the Magians, both of whom agree in making seven distinct apartments in hell. 2. See S. V. Miraj P.
351 54 The earliest cosmologies Heaven and Gabriel demanded that the door should be opened. And it was asked, Who is it? And he said, I am Gabriel. And they then said, Who is with you? And he answered, It is Mohammed. They said, Has Mohammed been called to the office of a prophet? He said, Yes. They said, Welcome Mohammed. His coming is well. Then the door was opened. And when one arrived in the first heaven, behold, one saw Adam. And Gabriel said to me, This is your father Adam. Salute him. Then one saluted Adam, and he answered it and said, You are welcome, good son and good prophet. After that Gabriel took me above, and we reached the second heaven. And he asked the door to be opened, and it was said, Who is it? He said, I am Gabriel. It was said, Who is with you? He said, Mohammed. It was said, Was he called? He said, Yes. It was said, Welcome Mohammed. His coming is well. Then the door was opened. And when one arrived in the second region, behold, one saw John and Jesus' sister sons. And Gabriel said, This is John, and this is Jesus. Salute both of them. Then one saluted them, and they returned it. After that they said, Welcome, good brother and prophet. After that we went up to the third heaven, and asked the door to be opened. And it was said, Who is it? Gabriel said, I am Gabriel. They said, Who is with you? He said, Mohammed. They said, Was he called? Gabriel said, Yes. They said, Welcome Mohammed. His coming is well. Then the door was opened. And when one entered the third heaven, behold, one saw Joseph. And Gabriel said, This is Joseph. Salute him. Then one did so, and he answered it and said, Welcome, good brother and good prophet. After that Gabriel took me to the fourth heaven, and asked the door to be opened. And it was said, Who is that? He said, I am Gabriel. It was said, Who is with you? He said, Mohammed. It was said, Was he called? Biblical, Rabbinical, and Quranic. 55. He said, Yes. They said, Welcome Mohammed. His coming is well. And the door was opened. And when one entered the fourth heaven, behold, one saw Enoch. And Gabriel said, This is Enoch. Salute him. And one did so, and he answered it and said, Welcome, good brother and prophet. After that Gabriel took me to the fifth heaven, and asked the door to be opened. And it was said, Who is there? He said, I am Gabriel. It was said, Who is with you? He said, Mohammed. They said, Was he called? He said, Yes. They said, Welcome Mohammed. His coming is well. Then the door was opened. And when one arrived in the fifth region, behold, one saw Aaron. And Gabriel said, This is Aaron. Salute him. And one did so, and he returned it and said, Welcome, good brother and prophet. After that Gabriel took me to the sixth heaven, and asked the door to be opened, and they said, Who is there? He said, I am Gabriel. They said, And who is with you? 
He said, Mohammed. They said, Is he cold? He said, Yes. They said, Welcome Mohammed. His coming is well. Then the door was opened. And when one entered the sixth heaven, behold, one saw Moses. And Gabriel said, This is Moses. Salute him. And one did so. And he returned it and said, Welcome, good brother and prophet. And when one passed him, he wept. And one said to him, What makes you weep? He said, Because one is sent after me, of whose people more will enter paradise than of mine. After that Gabriel took me up to the seventh heaven, and asked the door to be opened. And it was said, Who is it? He said, I am Gabriel. And it was said, Who is with you? He said, Mohammed. They said, Was he called? He said, Yes. They said, Welcome Mohammed. His coming is well. Then one entered the seventh heaven, and, behold, one saw Abraham. And Gabriel said, This is Abraham, your father. Salute him. Which one did, and he returned it. 56. The earliest cosmologies. And said, Welcome, good son and good prophet. After that one was taken up to the tree called Sidrata Timantaha. And behold its fruits were like water pots, and its leaves like elephant's ears. And Gabriel said, This is Sidrata Imantaha. And one saw four rivers there. Two of them hidden and two manifest. One said to Gabriel, What are these? He said, these two concealed rivers are in paradise. And the two manifest are the Nile and the Euphrates. After that, one was shown the Beitu e Mamar. After that a vessel full of wine, another full of milk, and another of honey, were brought to me. And one took the milk and drank it. And Gabriel said, Milk is religion. You and your people will be of it. After that the divine orders for prayers were fifty every day. Then one returned, and passed by Moses. And he said, What have you been ordered? One said, Fifty prayers every day. Then Moses said, Verily, your people will not be able to perform fifty prayers every day. And verily, one swear by God. One tried men before you. One applied a remedy to the sons of Israel, but it had not the desired effect. Return, then, to your Lord, and ask your people to be released from that. And one returned. And ten prayers were taken off. Then one went to Moses, and he said as before. And one returned to God's court, and ten prayers more were curtailed. Then one returned to Moses, and he said as before. Then one returned to God escort, and ten more were taken off. And one went to Moses, and he said as before. Then one returned to God, and ten more were lessened. Then one went to Moses, and he said as before. Then one went to God escort, and was ordered five prayers every day. Then one went to Moses, and he said, How many have you been ordered? One said, Five prayers every day. He said, Verily, your people will not be able to perform five prayers every day. For, verily, one tried men before you, and applied the severest remedy to the sons of Israel. Then return Biblical, Rabbinical, and Quranic 57 to your Lord, and ask them to be lightened. One said, have asked him till 1 a.m. quite ashamed. 
one cannot return to him again. But one am satisfied, and resign the work of my people to God. Then, when one passed from that place a crier called out one have my divine commandments, and have made them easy to my servants. Chapter 5 The Egyptian Universe in the year 1888 an eminent Egyptologist published in France and in America his conception of the worldview of the ancient dwellers upon the Nile. Finding it clearer and more confidently set forth than anyone had previously seen, one immediately made it, and the criticisms to which at the time one considered it open, the subject matter of a lecture. This was given before a class of graduate students in Boston University early in 1889. In the outline sheets distributed to the auditors illustrative diagrams were inserted. From the outline then used the following paragraphs or a verbatim extract. The cosmology of the Egyptians has received almost no attention at the hands of professed Egyptologists. No treatise on the subject has yet been published. In a number of articles on other subjects, Maspero has incidentally set forth the opinion that the Egyptians considered the form of the earth to be that of a flat oblong quadrangular slab with Egypt in its center. At each of the four comers there was an incredibly high post, forked at the top. These four pillars supported an immense slab of iron which constituted the firmament of heaven. Above this was a celestial ocean, the source of rain. The setting sun in returning to the east was not supposed to pass under the earth's lab nor 58. The Egyptian Universe 59 Yet over the heaven slab, but to slip through a hole in the mountain of the sunset. And embarking on a horizontal river to float between two parallel semicircular mountain ranges which extend on the same general level as the earth slab from the west point of the horizon round beyond the north point to the east point. This nocturnal voyage required 12 hours, during which time the sun was neither above nor beneath either heaven or earth, but endured a region of darkness to the north of both. Here follows a grand plan of the Egyptian earth according to Maspero, Fape. A. Figure A. Adding now the pillars for the heaven slab, we have the following, Fape. B. Adding now the slab end. Figure. They do it, as Maspero conceives it, we have the following, fake, she, figure C, Baku, mountain of the sunrise, Apito, mountain of sunset, pen named, supports of heaven, Egypt at center of earth's lap, Iron Heaven One commonly spelled doot or toot 60 The earliest cosmologies To find the fullest exposition, see Review DL Histoire des Religions, Nov. and Dec. 1888 p. 266, 270 for a less satisfactory exposition, in English, see his article entitled Egyptian Souls and Their World Slash in the New Princeton Review, July, 1888, p. 23, 36.1 This interpretation we cannot accept. It is not a critical construction of the data of Egyptian cosmology as furnished by the texts. It is sufficiently refuted by the following considerations. 1. The natural sky is so manifestly concave that no people has ever yet been found to believe it to be a flat slab, of iron or of any other matter. 2. The Egyptians had certain designations for heaven which expressed its curved form. See Broch, B. 
3. A people as intelligent as the ancient Egyptians in earliest historic ages cannot possibly have believed in the literal existence of four wooden or iron sky props taller than the highest course of sun or star, and strong enough to sustain an iron slab as wide and long as the visible heavens, with an equally extended ocean above it. One earth was not to the Egyptians what it is to us, a globe carried safely through space by the laws of gravitation. Everybody in Egypt knew that it was a flat, oblong, quadrangular slab, more like the upper board of a table than anything they could imagine. It was surmounted by a flat iron roof stretching at some distance from it and supported by four strong pillars which prevented it from falling and crushing what was underneath. Thus the world was like a two-storied house, the various parts of which might be connected, as they are in our houses, by a staircase or ladder. The Egyptians supposed that there was somewhere in the west a tall ladder which went up straight from earth to heaven. Nobody was allowed to climb it unless he knew the password, and, even after giving it, those poor souls were in danger of never reaching the top who were not helped by the hand of some pietous divinity. Once on the solid floor of the firmament, they traveled northward until they came to the brink of the Boreal Ocean. There they found the ferry boat or the Ibis of Thought, the Judge Osiris and his assessors, the islands of the happy, where they settled forever and ever amongst the indestructible stars, as indestructible as any of them. From the above cited article in the New Princeton Review. The Egyptian Universe. 61. 4. The four heaven pillars of the Egyptian mythology are never located by the Egyptian texts, as according to Maspero they would have to be, in four opposite directions from Egypt, but always in the remotest north. See Paradise Found, P. 74, and Brugge's statement that 1. Have their quoted. This fact alone is fatal to Maspero's entire interpretation. 5. In all Egyptian pictures where Shu is represented as supporting heaven upon his upstretched hands, he is placed directly under its middle or center. This in Maspero's interpretation would make Middle Egypt his proper mythological standing ground. His proper station, however, according to all mythological texts, is in the highest north, in fact, at the terrestrial pole. C. Brooks, B. 208, 210. Compare the chapters in Paradise Found which treat of the navel of the earth and 2. Navel of the heavens and of the pillars of Atlas. 6. Nearly every eminent Egyptologist except Maspero holds that the ancient Egyptians were acquainted with the true figure of the earth and that they had all the astronomical knowledge necessary to enable them to orient pyramids and temples to a hair as breadth, and to harmonize the solar and lunar years. Brooks, Chabas, Liebline, and Lefebure of this opinion. Liebline, in fact, confidently maintains that the texts show that the ancient Egyptians already understood and believed the heliocentric theory of the universe. See also Rawlinson S. Haradox A.M. Add. Vol. 2 p. 278-279. At the time the foregoing demurrer was written and placed in manifolded copies in the hands of my students, no man was esteemed a higher authority in the peculiar cosmography of Egypt than Maspero. It would be difficult to name a higher today. His exposition of 62. The earliest cosmologies. The Egyptian universe in the writings above named, and in his etudes, remained unchallenged by any professor of Egyptological studies. It is not surprising, therefore, that as recent and reliable a cosmologist as J. L. E. Dreyer, in his History of Planetary Systems, still describes the world of the Egyptians as a large box, and their stars as suspended by quartz. In the year 1895, however, in his work entitled The Dawn of Civilization, 
Maspero himself introduced into his earlier teachings some modifications, and presented a picture of his own devising to illustrate his riper view of the Egyptian cosmos. This picture we here reproduce for the study of the reader. His description in this revised form reads as follows, they imagined the whole universe to be a large box, nearly rectangular in form, whose greatest diameter was from south to north, and its least from east to west. The earth, with its alternate continents and seas, formed the bottom of the box. It was a narrow, oblong, and slightly concave floor, with Egypt in its center. The sky stretched over it like an iron ceiling, flat according to some, vaulted according to others. Its earthward face was capriciously sprinkled with lamps hung from strong cables. Since this ceiling could not remain in mid-air without support, they invented four columns, or rather four forked trunks of trees, to uphold it, similar to those which main. The Egyptian Universe 63 Tained the primitive house but it was doubtless feared lest some tempest should overturn them, for they were superseded by four lofty peaks rising at the four cardinal points and connected by a continuous chain of mound. The Egyptian Universe According to Maspero Section taken from Hermopolis To the left, the bark of the sun on the celestial river. Tains these were not supposed to form the actual boundary of the universe. A great river, analogous to the ocean stream of the Greeks, lay between them and its utmost limits. This river circulated upon a kind of ledge. 64. The earliest cosmologies. Projecting along the sides of the box a little below the continuous mountain chain upon which the starry heavens were sustained. On the north of the ellipse, the river was bordered by a steep and abrupt bank which soon rose high enough to form a screen between the river and the earth. The modifications here introduced are slight and of doubtful merit. The sun is made to set, not at a horizon level with the Sahara, but at one only a little below the level of the suspended stars in the zenith of the observer. Who can believe that the builders of the pyramids, watching a sunset, saw any such non-existent mountain heights to the west of them? And who can believe that any people capable of identifying today's sun with the sun of yesterday, and capable of inventing a real boat and a hidden world river for the purpose of accounting for his reappearance in the east after his disappearance in the west, would be ignorant of the fact that the moon and stars also travel across the sky to their setting, and that consequently they cannot possibly be cabled or chained to an immovable sky canopy of iron. It is hard to be patient with an author who can soberly ascribe such incredible crudities to the finders and the users of the Sothic year. One it seems quite time that some qualified expert should give us a thorough study on the Nile of Heaven. How utterly unlike thee! The Egyptian Universe 65 The latest writers on Egyptian science and religion, Breasted, Budge, Petri, Ehrman, Steindorf, von Streisand, Torney, Wiedmann, Spiegelberg, Schack Schackenberg, Navilli, and the rest, give us no noticeable improvement on Maspero's world picture. Asterisk 1 The cosmology which they express, or more commonly content themselves with implying, is in most cases simply inconstruable in thought. And since all our translators of the original Egyptian texts are men who neither expect nor search for any intelligible world concept in those texts, it is not to be anticipated that other investigators, unable to decipher technical terms and to test conjectures, will soon be able to help our baffled minds. However, now that we have discovered some unsuspected unity and rationality in the cosmological thought of the ancient Babylonians and their predecessors, may we not hope that at an early date some young and uncommitted Egyptologist will feel impelled to investigate the question whether the Baba Celestial Nile of Maspero's picture is the Nile of Heaven in the following text given in Erminus Religio Vitae. 68. Thou didst create the Nile in the depth and dost lead him hither at thy pleasure to give nourishment to men. 
Thou didst create the life nourishment of all distant lands and didst set a Nile in heaven that it may flow down to them. He forms waves upon the mountains like an ocean and moistens their fields. How beautiful are thy decrees, thou Lord of eternity! The Nile of heaven didst thou give over to the strange peoples and the animals of the desert, but the Nile from the depth comes for Egypt. One weedman ascribes to the Egyptians a belief in three shields, one above the earth, one on the earth, and one under the earth. Thy Toten and Ihr Reich im Glauben der Alten Segepter, Leipzig, 1900, s. 19. 66. The earliest cosmologies. Ionian world idea may not prove something of a clue to the Egyptian. Light is already coming, and as of old from the east. The fact that Lepsius found what seemed to him evidence of a plurality of heavens in Egyptian thought is encouraging. Many things in Brugge favor the supposition that the Egyptian cosmos resembled the prehistoric Euphration. For example, he finds that the stars are over the heads of the inhabitants of Hades, one and this precisely answers the last of the twelve requirements in Babylonian cosmology. If, as the Assyriologists unanimously assert, a cosmological symbolism underlay the pyramidal structures of Babylonia, why not also those of Egypt? And if, as Sais says, it was the four-cornered and pyramidal earth which was intentionally imaged in sanctuaries in the valley of the Euphrates, why not also in those others in the valley of the Nile? Two Winkler affirms that the culture of Babylonia and that of Egypt are no more to be regarded as distinct than are the civilizations of two modern civilized states, three in the same passage. 1. Religion and Mythology der Alten Jejipter, p. 204. 2. D. Miller, The Pyramidal Temple, in the Oriental and Biblical Journal, Chicago, Vol. 1 p. 169-178 Also, Boscoen, in the same, 1884, p. 118 Also other references in Cradle of the Human Race, p. 228 fe. Flinders Petri does not fail to remind us that under its sloped casing the Great Pyramid of Cheeps is a seven-staged one. See the Academy, London, April 18, 1891. Asterisk Himmels and Welterabild, S. 30, 31. For a fuller and more technical treatment of these matters, see Astronomisch Mythologisches, in his Altherientalischen Forschungen, D. Aid. 2. Also, Hommel, Grundrister. The Egyptian Universe 67 He shows that their astronomic divisions of world time were identical. Even Maspera, as we have seen, notices the singular agreement found in the most ancient thought of the two peoples with respect to the horizontal motion of the sun. Each people applied to its under-earth, that far-off original of Dante's pendant purgatory amount, terms strikingly descriptive of the inverted pyramid of our diagram. Among the terms applied to the Egyptian Amentier, mountain, pyramid, hidden mountain, inverted precinct. Nor should it be forgotten that, corresponding to the Semitic expression heaven of heavens, Navili has found in a litany of rather counterpart expression, the Hades of Hades. Asterisk one furthermore, as in Mithraism, and in the survival of Babylonian law which scholars call Sabinism, so in the oldest Egyptian teaching, the ladder of heaven, according to Street. Claire had just seven steps. To corresponding Hareto, in the Book of the Dead, chapter 144, we read of seven halls in the Geographia and Gesquit de Alten Orients, 2D. Awful. 1904 S. 113 FE Alfred Jeremias, Der Alte Orient und die Ägyptische Religion, in the scientific supplement of Liasiger Zeitung, No. 91, 1905 
knew it. Leap. 1907. 1. The Amenti of Amenti. 2. George Street. Flair in Biblia, Meriden, March, 1905, p. 371. When the Mithraic ladder had eight rounds, reference was expressly made to the heaven of the fixed stars as answering to the eighth. Franz Piment, My Stairs de Mithra, Brooks. 1899, 117. On the Egyptian Heaven Ladder, see Budge, The Gods of the Egyptians, 1, 167 f. 490. 2, 92, 241. As it afforded room for a three abreast, a remarkable parallel may be found described and pictured in Sir Munir Williams, Buddhism, p. 414, 419. 68. The earliest cosmologies. Underworld. The latest published studies by English as well as by continental experts reconfirm the traditional view of the derivation of the Egyptian culture from the valley of the Euphrates. It is the opinion of the present writer that in the end it will be found that whatever the crudities and confusions of the magic texts and popular conjurations, the astronomy and cosmology of the learned priests in Egypt through all traceable ages corresponded in every essential with the astronomy and cosmology taught in the Euphrates Valley. When the time of insight shall come, let due honor be paid to Professor Edward Roth, who in the face of an unbelieving generation of Egyptologists boldly affirmed that the doctrine of an eightfold series of heavens, seven of them planetary and one side real, all concentric and geocentric, was the genuine old Egyptian doctrine, one too even he was anticipated by Gignot, a French savant whose learning entitled him to rank with the best cosmologists of his age. Three since writing the foregoing one have been gratified to notice that in his recent course of lectures in this country Professor Steindorf, of Leipzig, has all unconsciously set forth in a single sentence what one aim representing us have. One Egypt and Western Asia in the light of recent discoveries, by L. W. King and R. H. Hall, London, 1907, p. 3244. Two guests get answer Abendländischen philosophy. D. Aid. 1, 167, 199. 2, 88. Free Cruiser Gigniot, Religions de Antiquity, Vol. 1, 488N. The Egyptian Universe. 69. In been in all likelihood the true original worldview of the Egyptians. In reporting what seems to him a chaos of discordant conceptions of the cosmos, he incidentally remarks that according to some texts, under the earth is above the like of the earth, which is made exactly like the earth and the heavens or world and heavens, he means of course, and which is peopled by the dead. Let us hope that the worthy successor of Abers may soon find in this conception of an underworld which is the perfect and typical counterpart of our overworld, the solution of many problems. Yeah. 1. Religion of the Ancient Egyptians, 1905, p. 35. 2. Long ago, P. translated an oft occurring Egyptian expression, La Double Terra. Mythology to Piptian, Paris, 1879, p. 74. On this, Gerald Massey remarks, it has been assumed by some Egyptologists that the two Earths slash or the double Earth slash were limited to the division of space into south and north by the passage of the sun from east to west. But in the making of Amenti the one Earth was divided into upper and lower, with a firmament or sky to each, and thus the Earth was duplicated. Ancient Egypt, London, 1907, p. 411. Italics mine. Here the true conception seems clearly expressed, but he just misses the true relation of the two Earths as antipodal, for on page 410 he places the lower and its firmament within the Earth. 
a mistake which appears again on page 413, in his criticism of Maspero's description of the universe. On page 347 he even misses the true relation of the celestial hemispheres in passages where they are clearly pictured by reversed signs as upper and lower, and where their right relation has been suggested by Renouf and others. Chapter 6 The Homeric Universe it is not greatly to the credit of Western scholarship that from the time of the revival of learning in Europe until well into the last quarter of the 19th century, no interpreter of Homer suggested as a permissible conjecture the idea that the Earth of the Iliad and Odyssey is an unsupported sphere of spheroid in the center of the stoistry. When, in the year 1881, this idea was presented, first in the New York Independent, and a little later in the Boston University Yearbook, Volume X, Drive. L. R. Packard, professor of the Greek language and literature in Yale University, wrote, If it is true, all our books and maps are wrong, and we must admit that all scholars have been mistaken in their understanding of the ancient records. The general incredulity showed that fuller proof was needed. Accordingly, in 1885, in my work on the cradle of the human race, one gave a more extended exposition of the entire subject, an exposition based upon a critical examination of every cosmographical datum found in the Homeric poems, and upon a study of all explanations which previous interpreters of repute had pop minus 70. The Homeric Universe 71 List the whole constituting a treatise of more than 50 octava pages. In this it was shown that if the cosmographical statements and implications in Homer are to have any harmonious interpretation, the interpreter will have to proceed upon the theory that the earth of the poems is a sphere. So convincing was the demonstration that many eminent scholars on both sides of the Atlantic at once accepted the new doctrine, one indeed, since its publication, the writer has not seen one attempt to answer his arguments or to establish by fresh evidence the former teaching that the Homeric Earth is a flat disk, having within it, or to the west of it on a level with its central plane, a cavern-like realm of Hades. Of course, an interpreter may say, with Professor William Cranston Lawton, drive. Warren's hypothesis accounts for the statements of Homer more clearly than any other, and still declined to find in the hypothesis indubitable proof that the Greeks in Homeric times, or even that one of their bards, held the conception of a spherical earth. Professor Lawton himself, with characteristic frankness, remarks, in my own mind one vacillate between accepting it and incredulity as to Homer as having any clear geometrical ideas and theories at all. 1. See reception accorded to the true key to ancient cosmology slash in the appendix to the cradle of the human race, p. 450-457. 2. Art and Humanity in Homer, New York, 1896, p. 183. 72. The Earliest Cosmologies. Of course, also an interpreter may say, as many have, we are not concerned to find an interpretation that harmonizes all the cosmological statements of the poems, and for the reason that any discrepancies discoverable in those statements are welcome evidence in support of our thesis that the poems are composite productions, written by many different authors, and reflecting the cosmological views of different epochs. The author of our latest and best American handbook of Homeric antiquities, Professor Seymour, does not join this company. While admitting the poet issues of earlier material, he says, these poems have such unity as cannot easily be explained if they are the work of several poets. And he refers his readers to my interpretation as affording a way in which Homer may not only be harmonized with himself, but also harmonized with Pindar. One to reproduce in this place my Homeric studies of 1885 would give to our present chapter a disproportionate length and significance. Suffice it, therefore, to say that they presented from the Iliad and Odyssey what is to many convincing evidence, not only of a one life in the Homeric age, by Professor Thomas Day Seymour, New York, 1907.
Professor Seymour not only commends Friedrich Blass's admirable defense of the unity of the Homeric poems, but also adds, the stamp of a great personality seems to lie upon each. But during recent years scholars have been so busy in searching for proofs of the different authorship of different parts of the poems that they have overlooked indications of unity of purpose, of spirit, and of execution. P. 15. The Homeric Universe Spherical earth, but also of a plurality of heavens, one furthermore, a clear reference to the upright axis of the heavens and earth was found in the pillar of Atlas, to a unitary cosmical water system closely corresponding to that of the Indo-Iranians was brought to view, free new light was thrown upon the nightly journey of the sun from west to east, for finally, Hades was identified as an inverted country, beneath our earth yet not within it, five in compensation for the brevity of this summary, one of the discussions referred to is reproduced in the appendix to the present volume. Also a paper on Homer as abode of the living, printed in the Boston University Yearbook of 1885. Comparing now the Homeric universe with the far-off Babylonian, we discover in the 1. The Cradle of the Human Race, p. 338-350 2. p. 350-358 on page 191f. Reference was also made to the thoroughly Babylonian doctrine of Anaxagoras, Anaximenes, and other Ionic philosophers, as to the primeval coincidence of the terrestrial zenith with the celestial pole, and the horizontal motion of the sun in its daily circuits around the perpendicular axis of the universe. This feature of early Greek teaching is well brought out in the article on astronomy in Dorenberg and Siblio, Dictionnaire de Antiquites Grecs et Romains, Paris, 1875. B. 254, 256, 333, 335. Less than P. 336, 338. 6B. 467, 487. That this Homeric conception of the underworld, as identical with the southern hemisphere of the Earth, was still current centuries after the age of Homer, is evident from a remarkably clear cosmographic passage in the Pseudoplatonic Dialogue of Axiacus, 371a. See comments in J. A. E. Stewart, The Myths of Plato, London, 1905, p. 110. And where interval interpolations by the translator render the version of the passage by George Bergs, in Bones Plato v. 53, quite worthless. 74. The earliest cosmologies. Former no mention of seven, or eight, as the number of the heavens, nor is there mention of the earth as four-cornered. On the other hand, however, we do find, in both systems, the geocentric feature, the plural heavens feature, one, the perpendicular world axis, the earth-encompassing ocean stream, and, the outer merhades, under yet not within the earth. Taken together, the five correspondences are certainly striking evidence of a common origin of the two worldviews. The most noticeable point of disagreement is perhaps this, that while in Babylonian thought the earth terminates in the second heaven, and furnishes a palace floor for Shamash in his own particular sphere, it seems in the Odyssey to terminate in Calypso Isle, at the navel of the sea. Curiously enough, however, the seeming disagreement includes a very remarkable common feature. For, like as the Babylonian symbol of Shamash shows the four-faced world fountain from which all waters proceed, so in Calypso Isle the same supernatural fount pours its fourfold flood toward four opposing points of the horizon. Possibly another obscure point in Homer's cosmos may yet receive at least a partial illumination from the Babylonian. Interpreters One till it goes yet farther and says The Greek mythology speaks of the seven layers of heaven over one another. The Arctic Home in the Vedas, 1903, p. 291. 
the Homeric universe. 75. Have never quite known what to make of Homer as two world thresholds, the one above and the other underneath his earth. These cannot be dismissed as the momentary fancy of a single poet, for they figure in Hesiod as well. How would they fit into the Babylonian worldview? Perfectly. In our diagram we have seen that the great world highway for gods traveling through the celestial spheres was called the Way of Anu. Corresponding to this, beneath the earth, was the Way of Enki, or E. Along this latter were the seven world gates successively passed by Ishtar in her descent to visit the Queen of the Netherworld. In the Journal of the American Oriental Society, in my first article on the Babylonian and pre-Babylonian cosmology, one suggested that the Ozum doors of Psalm 24 were the celestial counterparts of those passed by Ishtar. And this suggestion was unhesitatingly endorsed by Professor Says. But if such were the two series of world doors, the one high above the earth, and the other as deep beneath it, the upper and under thresholds mentioned by Homer and Hesiod would perfectly fit the first or the last of the doors in each direction. 1. Originally, other agreements between the Homeric and the Babylonian worldview may 1. The upper series of these world doors is clearly and correctly conceived of by J. A. Stuart in his Myths of Plato, p. 351. 76. The earliest cosmologies will have existed. Agreements which, at a later period, were gradually lost in the successive editings of the poems by redactors schooled in the later systems of Greek astronomy and cosmology. In any case, it is reasonable to conjecture that, long anterior to the Homeric age, the Greeks received their cosmology as they did their alphabet from Asiatic neighbors who represented, and in their commercial and political intercourse diffused, the ideas and the teachings of the earlier Babylonian and pre-Babylonian culture. The father of history, himself a Greek, did not hesitate to say that his countrymen received from the Babylonians even their division of the day into twelve hours and their instruments for accurately measuring them, one scarcely had one laid down my pen after writing the foregoing sentence when a new monthly issue of the Edinburgh Review of Theology and Philosophy came to hand. In it, fresh from the pen of the well-known translator of the Code of Hammurabi, Drive. H. W. Johns of Cambridge University stood the following, what evolutionary process lay behind the one Herodotus, 2, 109. That is a testimony of antiquity. Here is one of two day wind tales, the Ionic philosopher, astounded the Ionic Greek world by foretelling a solar eclipse, he borrowed his wisdom from the Babylonians, as Pythagoras drew his philosophy, with its symbolism of numbers, from the same Semitic source. Professor J. A. Craig in Winkler S. History of Babylonia, New York, 1907, p. 143. On the far-reaching influence of the Babylonians over Greek culture see Muller's Handbook der Eidassischen Althothonsifs, v. 453-457. The Homeric Universe. 77. Babylonian religious thought is lost for us in the mists of prehistoric time. We may indeed amuse ourselves by speculating as to its progressive development, but we shall find it more useful to estimate exactly its nature and potentialities as the finished product, which alone we can know, and can now know so fully. It spread throughout the world, with local variations. Egypt and early Arabia, Elam and Iran, Persia, India, China, the Mycenaean culture, Etruscan and early American, prehistoric Europe, North Africa, Spain, and Crete show such marked traces of it that it may fairly be regarded as common to mankind. The only excuse for calling it Babylonian is that in Babylonia we find its oldest presentation, and that the clearest and fullest. While astronomy is so fundamentally its grand stuff that the home of astronomy must have the credit of its production. It is a philosophy of the cosmos, a religion. Written on the sky itself, like the revelation Hume demanded. 
In such language something of the enthusiasm of a cuneiform decipherer is doubtless to be seen, but were to find a really scholarly present the estimate of the influence of Babylonian and pre-Babylonian ideas upon human thought and human history expressed in terms more sober, one scarcely know. Certainly the One Review of Theology and Philosophy, Edinburgh, Vol. 3, P. 78. 78. The earliest cosmologies. Latest estimates presented by German scholars are often less moderate rather than more. 1F, De Litz, Babel and Bible. Winkler, Die Babylonische Kvalcher in Ihren Besehungen zur Entsregen. E, Scheremias und H, Winkler, im Kampf für den Alten Orient. Where und Streitz Griffin, Leap. 1907. C. Fries, Babylonische und Griechische Mythologie, in Neue Jarb. Für das Klassische Chalfertum, X, 689 FE. And Tersichungen, in Beitridge zu Alien Geskete, IV, 227 FE. And Apple, in the National Zeitung, Village of Oct. 5, 1906. Chapter 7 The Indo-Iranian Universe in any attempt to determine the earliest worldview of the East Aryans, the safest method is doubtless to begin with the oldest conception of the universe definitely set forth in Hindu or in Old Persian literature, and from this to work backward and upward in the interpretation of any cosmographical data presented only incidentally and fragmentarily in sources of an early. Pursuing this course, one must first give attention to the world concept set forth in the Surya Siddhanta, a Sanskrit treatise mentioned with other astronomical works at least 1400 years ago. In this work the Earth is described in express terms as a globe, and supported in empty space, central in its relation to all heavenly bodies, and with its polar axis, like the Babylonian, perpendicular in position. At its upper or northern pole an extremely lofty mountain lifts itself high into the heavens, while at the southern or under pole a corresponding mountain projects downward an equal distance. The former is represented as the mountain of the gods, Sura, the latter as the mountain of the demons, Asura. The two are the opposite 79. AD. The earliest cosmologies. Ends of one stupendous material Massachusetts which, as a kind of core, extends directly through the earth from highest to lowest point. One a girdle of oceanic waters surrounds the globe at the equator, separating the upper from the lower hemisphere. On or near the equator, equidistant from each other, are four notable cities which belong respectively to four large divisions of the upper hemisphere called Varshas. In consequence of the perpendicular position of the polar axis, the plane of the movements of the sun and moon around the earth is necessarily horizontal. North is synonymous with up, and south with down. Yet the author fully understands that up and down are wholly relative terms. And he expressly states that everywhere upon the globe, men think their own place to be uppermost. Here, then, a thousand years before the days of Columbus, we have a perfectly clear-cut presentation of the Earth as spherical, or rather spheroidal, in figure. Considering the age and country in which it appears, one must pro one. The name here given to this Earth core is Meru, but in other Sanskrit writings this name is almost invariably restricted to the upper end, that is, to the mountain of the gods, otherwise known as Sumeru, that is, Meru the Beautiful. On the great antiquity of the word Meru, see Cradle of the Human Race, p. 183. Also p. 236. 2. See Surya Sitanta, Tar. By Ebenezer Burgess, with notes by W. D. Whitney, New Haven, U.S.A. 1860. Also the translation by Pundit Bapu Devasastri, Calcutta, 1861. 
53, chapter G, reads as follows, Everywhere upon the globe of the earth men think their own place to be uppermost. But since it is a globe in the ether, where should there be an upper, or where an underside of it? The Indo-Iranian Universe 81 Nam's the concept of great interest. Though strictly Indian, it cannot essentially misrepresent the Iranian conception, for in this also we find, with other correspondences, an upright world axis, and the two antipodal polar mountains, sacred Harabar Azadi in the north, and Erezer, dark mount of demons in the south. The Surya Sitanta, as we have seen, incidentally alludes to four of the mythological varshas into which the surface of the upper hemisphere was supposed to be divided. This leads to the inquiry, how many such divisions were supposed to exist, and what were their names? This double question is fully answered in Sanskrit and Iranian documents of unknown antiquity. And as the number given in the Iranian tradition, seven, is the same as in the Indian, the evidence is strong that a sevenfold division of the northern or upper hemisphere was held and taught at a time prior to the separation of the primitive Indo-Iranian stock into its later Hindu and Persian branches. The further fact that in the two gradually differentiated languages the names of the individual divisions bear no resemblance to each other seems good evidence, so far as it goes, that neither people, in some period subsequent to their separation, borrowed its scheme from the other. The Iranians called their geographical divisions Keshvers. The names and respective. 82. The earliest cosmologies. Locations of the seven are given in well-known Avestan texts. Also their relation to the Holy Mount. Like the Varshas, the Keshvers were supposed to be separated from each other by stupendous mountain ranges impassable by man. In both systems, the Persian and the Hindu, the highest and divinest division was the one out of whose center rose the heaven-piercing mountain of the gods. The productions and scenery of this region were little short of heavenly. Its form in both systems was that of a perfect square. The Iranians called it Kvaniras, the Indian Zilavrita. In studies published in the year 1885, the present writer gave diagrams showing the agreements and disagreements of the two mythological maps. These diagrams were the first ever attempted on a polycentric projection. After examining them and the accompanying exposition, Professor F. Spiegel, foremost of ironists then living, wrote as follows. So far as the argument moves within the circle of my studies, one can assure you of my perfect agreement. Your exhibition of the arrangement of the Indian Dvipas and Iranian Keshvers has essentially corrected my own and clear ideas on this subject. Also of the correctness of your opinion respecting the cosmical water system of the prehistoric Indians and Iranians one I am perfectly convinced. Thus far we have occupied ourselves with one the cradle of the human race, p. 152-159 The Indo-Iranian Universe 83 The Earth's upper hemisphere merely How now was the under-hemisphere pictured in Indo-Iranian thought? Notice, first of all, the perfect symmetry of the two halves of the upper hemisphere whichever way we may imagine it divided by a vertical plane passing through its axis. Imagine the face of a mariner's compass painted on the horizontal top of Holy Harabar Azadi, or of Sumeru, and then let the division by the vertical plane be on the line marked north and south, and each half of the divided hemisphere would be a perfect counterpart of the other. Let it be on the line marked east and west, and again each half would be a perfect counterpart of the other. Even on a line connecting the northeast and southwest, at the northwest and southeast angles of the mountain, the result would be the same.
This fact suggests that in a world so symmetrically constructed as this, we should antecedently expect to find that a plane having the globe on the line of the equator would in like manner show the southern half to be a perfect counterpart of the northern. The fact that in the Sirius it hand to the two polar mountains are described as opposite and perfectly similar ends of one and the same outcropping earth core, suggests the same idea of geographic correspondence throughout the two hemispheres. This antecedent expectation is further strength. 84. The earliest cosmologies. And when it is noticed that in the same treatise the parallelism is carried so far that a south polar star is placed as far below the south polar mount as the north polar star is above the mountain of the gods. The full confirmation of the expectation seems to come when we discover that, at least in Indian thought, the divisions of the under hemisphere were in number precisely the same as the varshas of the upper hemisphere, namely seven. And that while these underworld divisions were called pathless, nothing in the etymology of the name, or in the extant descriptions of the regions, is in the least inconsistent with the requirements of the law of perfect symmetry elsewhere found prevailing throughout the system. But if this law holds, the seven pathless, in form and collocation, must be exact counterparts of the Varshas. Only, like the polar mountain about which they are grouped, inverted in position. In no case is it permissible to picture them as dark caverns in the heart of the earth, as so many writers have done. The Vishnu Purana BB 2. Chach V. and the Mahabharata, Adyoga Parva, Sect, Skev, described them as excellent regions, as surpassingly beautiful, and as illuminated by our circling sun and moon. In the story of Superaga we read of a voyage which a merchant ship made to one of the Patalas. Upon the surface of the earth. Once there, the Jatakamala P. 126-127 The Indo-Iranian Universe. 85 Therefore, and not within it, they must have been located. Passing now from the earth to the regions above and below it, we find named and described in the sacred books of the Indian seven heavens, including Brahma S, above and adjacent to the central earth. Corresponding to these we also find seven subcelestial hells. It is true that the Code of Monu speaks of 21 hells, but as Professor Hopkins, of Yale, well remarks, the oldest Purana, the Markandeya, has but seven, a conception older than Monuis, are the later lists of thousands. The Padma Purana has also seven hells. The same number of heavens and hells is traceable in the Avestan literature, to one we may therefore safely infer that the untraceably ancient conception of seven concentric planetary spheres revolving about an upright axis of earth and heaven was an essential part of the prehistoric Indo-Iranian world the Dvipas now demand our attention. In the cosmography of the Puranas we are given elaborate accounts of seven parts of the 1. The religions of India, p. 443, Kiesi 478 Already in the Rigveda the heavens, the earth, and the lower regions are all conceived as divided sevenfold. Bal Gangadhar Tilak. 2. Parsi mythology knows also of seven heavens, remarks Dharmestatar in his introduction to the Vendadad, sacred books of the East Vol. If B. Lex. In the Bandahish, Chach. Koksov, the abodes of the demons are so correlated with the seven planets as to show that they are of the same number, S.E. Vol. V. 114. Even in the literature of the Jains we find the seven-staged heaven. S. E. Vol. Tolvelv, P. 222. 86. The earliest cosmologies.
Universe denominated Delpus. What and where were these? The word has been explained by Sanskrit etymologists as signifying between waters. Accordingly, Indianists have usually translated it island. Every island is certainly between waters. The question arises, then, where, and what, are these seven islands of the Indo-Aryan world? Light begins to dawn when we discover that they are all concentric and geocentric. Remarkable islands. One, two, but are they flat concentric rings like those surrounding the planet Saturn? So say most modern scholars. Indeed, one know of no dissentient authority. Books have been issued with the picture of a target board consisting of a bulk psi and six or seven surrounding rings, as a true diagram of the Hindu universe. Even Thibaut in his right scholarly treatise gives us nothing better, free can this be correct? Are the surfaces of the seven islands, like the rings of the target board, in a common plane? In other words, are the one. Their names are Jambu, Plaksha, Salmov, Kuza, Kroncha, Sokka, and Pushkara. The Vishnu Purana adds, they are surrounded severally by seven great seas, the Sea of Salt Water, Lavana of Sugar Cane Juice, Ikshu of Wine, Sura of Clarified Butter, Sarpis of Curds, Dadhi of Milk, Dugda, and of Fresh Water, Jala. Shambhudvipa is the center of all these. And in the center of this is the Golden Mountain Meru. 2. Drive. White House might easily claim that Vipa should be translated firmament, for in his view of Jen. 1. 61 function of a firmament is to serve as a separating barrier between waters above and below. This would at once give us seven firmaments as a feature of the Indorian world. 3. C. Grundris der Indorischen Philology and Dauer, 1889, p. 21. The Indo Iranian Universe. 87. Islands of a common height. The Puranic writers say no. On the contrary, their respective heights, measured from the horizontal plane of the Earth's center, seem to follow some law of progression, arithmetic or geometric. How, then, are we to view them in their relation to each other? In a prize essay, written by Babu Shom, a native Hindu, and printed in the Asiatic Researches as long ago as 1849, is found a statement which may prove to be the key to the total Indo-Iranian system. It presents a conception of the cosmos fascinating in interest, one far more complex and highly developed than Western scholars have ever credited to the Hindu of any age. At the same time it is very reassuring to remember that the author of the essay was not seeking to gain credit for his countrymen, or for their prehistoric ancestors. On the contrary, the title he gave to his essay was, Physical Errors of Hinduism. He had become a Christian, had become acquainted with the astronomic and geographic science of the Western nations, in fact, had become a teacher in a Christian college, and the whole aim of his treatise was to expose the utter untenableness and irrationality of the orthodox Hindu teachings in the realm of science. Furthermore, his representation of the Hindu teaching of his time is the more trustworthy from the fact that he bases it. 88. The Earliest Cosmologies Not on literary products of distant times, but on the authentic teaching of the leading pundits then living in Calcutta. The universe conception set forth by Shom as fit only for scornful repudiation is one which, if it had been found in a dialogue of Plato, would long ago have been world famous as a supreme creation of poetic or mythopoeic imagination. It would also have been hailed by all competent commentators as a vastly more convincing proof of the influence of Pythagorean teachings upon Plato than any we now find and prize in the dialogues that have reached us. The task of presenting the conception in words is far from easy. First of all, one must recall to mind the Indo-Aryan earth, 
Chambud Valpa, with its upright polar axis, its upper and under polar mountains, its seven symmetrically arranged varshas in the upper hemisphere, all separated by boundary ranges of mountains of cosmic proportions. Its seven symmetrically arranged patalas in the under hemisphere, all also separated by boundary ranges of cosmic proportions, each hemisphere in these respects the exact counterpart of the other. Next, one must conceive of Plaksha as a yet larger globe, also upright as to its polar axis, but including in the center of its capacious interior Jambudvipa with all its varied populations. This new globe must, furthermore, in its divisions. The Indo-Iranian Universe 89 Everywhere correspond to Jambudvipa hemisphere to hemisphere, Varsha to Varsha, Patala to Patala, boundary range to boundary range. In it the inhabitants must be taller than those of Jambu, their lives longer, their powers more godlike. Then at double the distance of Plaksha from Jambu one must think of a vastly greater globe including in the center of its capacious interior both the others, and answering to them in its divisions, hemisphere to hemisphere, Varsha to Varsha, Patala to Patala, boundary range to boundary range throughout. This is Salmali, the third of this wonderful series. Its inhabitants must notably outshine and outlive the inhabitants of Plaksha. Again, far out beyond, above and beneath Salmali must be imaged Kuza, and as before the number, shape, and mutual relations of its Varshas and Patalas must precisely correspond to those of the inner Dvipas respectively. To this in like manner the remaining fifth, sixth, and seventh must one by one be added, each following the same law of subdivision, each removed from the last by twice the distance of the last preceding. Each filled with suitable mythologic populations. Until with the seventh, the all including Pushkara, the series is complete. With this the mental picture of the world whole lacks but one final feature, the almost infinitely remoter Lokaloka, the star. 90. The earliest cosmologies Studded shell of Brahma as primal universe egg In such a universe a mathematic mind would find its paradise In it a right line in any direction from the center point of Jambudvelpa, if sufficiently produced, would pass through an identically shaped and bounded Varsha or Patala in each of the seven concentric spheres Conversely, to close our description as Babu Shom closes his, the seven divisions in each of the continents, Dvipas, are separated by seven chains of mountains and seven rivers, lying breadthwise, and placed at such inclinations in respect to one another that if a straight line be drawn through any chain of mountains or rivers and its corresponding mountains or rivers on the other continents, and produced toward the central island, Jambudvelpa, it would meet the center of the earth. This incomparably complete world concept the just quoted author contemptuously dismisses as a monstrous picture of geographic nonsense. Might it not more fittingly be styled the consummate flower of all mythological world making, ancient or modem? What can have been its origin, what its history? One Asiatic researches, Vol. She, B. 411. In the following expression of the doctrine of celestial and terrestrial correspondences we seem to find a late Persian survival of the older cosmological idea, whatever is on earth is the resemblance and shadow of something that is in the celestial sphere. While that resplendent thing, the prototype that is in the sphere, remaineth in good condition, it is well also with its shadow. The Sayer, the Book of Shet, quoted in Upper Myth History and Doctrine of Buddhism, P. 21. The Indo-Iranian Universe. 91. Before this question every science dealing with the past is silent. That such a conception of the universe cannot have been a modern. A medieval product of Indian musing is absolutely certain. It shimmers through the ancient Vedas, wherein we read of the seven heaven fortresses cleft asunder by Indra, and of the seven bottomed ocean below.
One that identified the rise of Buddhism and Jainism seems clear from the differing conceptions and misconceptions of it found in the earliest extant documents relating to these largely illiterate sects, to that its essential features antedated the separation of the East Aryans into Iranians and Indians as well now demonstrated. 1. Regain, La Religion Vdik, 2, 140. In the Vedic texts the idea that the earth is a flat disk nowhere occurs. Zimmer, Alton Dishes Leben, Prize Essay, Berlin, 1879, p. 359. 2. It is surely not strange that a cosmos so complex as this should have been misconceived by mendicant monks. No map can correctly picture it. With only his staff for a pencil, and the level ground for a drawing board, the best an ancient teacher could do was to mark out seven concentric circles as an equatorial section of the Dvipas, and require his pupil to learn their names and the names of the beings that peopled them. If perhaps he sometimes would fill his seven concentric tracings with water and let these rings represent the sea-like spaces between the Dvipas so that the intervening earth rings might represent the more solid Dvipas themselves. Even without such a prompting to misunderstanding, it would not be strange if the uninstructed or half-instructed should often have come to conceive of the Dvipa world as a series of seven islands, ring-like in shape, concentric, each, except the innermost, flat, and in a single horizontal plane. Such seems to have been a common imagination among the Buddhist monks. Through these it was gradually spread over a large part of southeastern Asia, though here and there traces of something more adequate to the original thought are discoverable. Unfortunately, this target board picture of Indian cosmography was early communicated to the European public, and is still accepted as the original and orthodox system of Hindu teaching. 92. The earliest cosmologies, by the number and character of the correspondences traceable between the cosmologies of the two peoples, in both we find the seven heavens with their respective regents, the zodiac of twelve signs, the sevenfold division of the earth, the antipodal mountains at the two poles, and a unitary cosmic water system in each case starting from and returning to a point directly above the sacred mountain of the north. The seven concentric spheres certainly carry us back to ancient Babylon, as do also the names of the Iranian months. One furthermore, the correspondences in Indian thought of sphere to sphere, and of all to the terrestrial center sphere, are but a fuller and more luxuriant development of the parallels found and often remarked upon in the Babylonian thought of heavenly and earthly regions, too. In a paper in the appendix to this volume. 1. From the most powerful nation of the ancient Semitic world, not from kindred India, came the system of terminology of the Zoroastrian months. Louis H. Gray, Origin of the Names of the Avesta Months, in American Journal of Semitic Language and Literature, 1904, p. 201. 2. Grundeligen für das Verstandnis altbabylonischer Himmels und Weltkunde ist die Erkenntnis, das Jeder Begriff, Jeder und Tafel in den Verschiensten Weltfeilen wieder ein Entspress Spiegelbild haben muss. Loft, Erdun Wasserreich der Unteren Welt, and Sir Erd, Haben Irgegen Steich in den Oberen, im Himmel, und in a Holb dieser Finden sich wieder dies Alben und Tafel, so das we im Moss und Guick die Kleinen Fall immer die Grossen wieder holen. Jeder Fall bildet wieder einen Mikrokosmos für sich. Hugo Winkler, Altorientalisch Forschungen, D8. 3, 1, S. 179. Winkler, however, like the Indo-Iranian scholars, has failed to see that the marked correspondences between the upper world and the underworld are to be pictured in thought as resulting simply from the antipodal location of the upper and under halves of the cosmic whole. The Indo-Iranian Universe. 93. One have noted 20 striking agreements between the Indo-Iranian and the prehistoric Euphrasian world pictures.
A stronger confirmation of Hermann Oldenburg's conjecture that the Indo-Iranians prehistorically borrowed from the Babylonians or Akkadians seven deities, representing the sun, the moon, and the five remaining planets, could hardly be desired. One is a not an appropriate close of the present chapter. One will here give an illustration of the help which one venture to hope our new interpretation of the Babylonian worldview may yet afford in the interpretation of certain dark and difficult passages in Sanskrit and Western texts. In the Gemini Upanishad Brahmana occurs a most puzzling statement touching the mutual local relations of Jambudvipa and Plaksha. Years ago it seemed to me utterly unintelligible. It reads, the navel of the earth lies one span minus one am following Thibaut S translation, one span to the north of Plaksha. Thibaut speaks of the strangeness and interest of the passage, but can give no explanation. No Indianist to my knowledge has ever attempted to give one. No interpreter accepting the prevailing view of the Indian cosmos can hope to find a rational meaning in the statement. Proceeding according to the target board world map, the farther one proceeds to. One Day Religion de Veda, Berlin, 1894, p. 192-195. The earliest cosmologies. The north of Plaksha, the farther one is from the navel of the earth, and indeed from the earth as a whole. But the moment one looks at our diagram of the Babylonian world, the puzzling text is no longer puzzling. In the cradle of the human race, it was shown that in the ancient literatures, the term the navel of the earth ordinarily signifies the northern terrestrial pole. This, however, in the prehistoric worldview, is at the level of the north pole of the second heaven, and therefore one interval, a span, to the north of the north pole of the first heaven, which latter belongs to Plaksha. The baffling statement is now as luminous as the heavens to which it takes us. Chapter V The Buddhistic Universe Buddhism, as everybody knows, is a special outgrowth of antecedent Brahmanical thought and teaching among the Hindus. Naturally, therefore, its cosmology is but a modification of that of the Hindu teachers before and at the time of Gautama the Buddha. Of its deviations from the parent system the following are the most worthy of notice. First, its extravagant multiplication of heavens beyond the sixth. Second, its substitution of 8 for 7 as the standard number for the Narakas, Hells. Third, its transformation of the four equatorial varshas of the Puranic Earth into fantastically shaped islands located at four respectively opposite points in the seventh or outer sea. Fourth, its gradual ignoring of the four sacred world drivers prominent in the earlier Hindu teaching and its resulting final loss of the cosmic water system of the Puranas. As to the first, the parent system in its 1. The Hindu cosmology which in Buddha's time was considered orthodox went into new and fantastic developments of its own. So that even in the Puranas, our chief sources of information, there are many confused and contradictory teachings. So great is this confusion that we cannot now identify with certainty any but the most fundamental features, and affirm that they beyond question had a place in the Hindu world concept at a date as early as that of the rise of Buddhism. A. 95. 96. The Earliest Cosmologies Enumeration of the heavens was accustomed to stop with the seventh, that of Brahma, the highest of Hindu gods. In the books of the Buddhists, however, we now find in place of the one heaven of Brahma sixteen of formed Brahmas and four of formless Brahmas, and making with the original six below the Brahmaloka, twenty-six heavens in all. Moreover, of the countless world units, Sakwalas, in the countless aggregate which fills all space, every one has this precise series of six and twenty heavens. The second of the enumerated points of divergence is noted by Professor Hopkins in his work on the religions of India, p. 443, but neither he nor any other writer known to me has suggested what seems the most probable explanation of the disparity. 
The Atel Avici is given such exceptional dimensions, and is placed at such an exceptional distance from the world center, and is otherwise so differentiated from the nearer seven, that it seems spatially related to the others precisely as the eighth nether hemisphere is to the other seven in the Babylonian world concept. It is not improbable, therefore, that the difference in the two enumerations results from the Buddhists including in their count an underworld which, as a sacred appanage of the perfect world of Brahma, seemed to the Brahmanists too holy to be here included. As to the third point, one know of no non. The Buddhistic Universe 97 Buddhistic Indian document in which anything is said of the four great islands, or Iceland continents, in the outermost of the seven concentric seas. In Buddhist cosmography, however, these are exceedingly important portions of the universe. One of them, Jambudvalpa, is the home of the present human race. The one on the side of Meru opposite to us bears the name Uttarakuru which name shows that the island is merely a transformed and translocated Varsha of the older system. The triangular shape of our own island suggests, if it does not show, that it is in like manner a transformed and translocated Bharata, India. To which has now been transferred the name Jambudvalpa, formerly applied to the total body made up of the seven Varshas. The fourth of the enumerated deviations is easier to explain than any of the others. The central teachings of the Buddha rendered it impossible for his followers to ascribe saving efficacy to baths in the heaven-descended Ganga, the Ganges. Very early, therefore, in Buddhist circles the traditional belief in the sanctity of these divine waters must have been left behind. But with the passing of that belief must also have passed the traditionary belief in that elaborate water system of the world in which 4N1 passage in the Mahabharata, Rho, V, 10, P. 20. The four equatorial Varshas are, it is true, called islands, but they are still left closed beside Meru. The passage is further interesting from the fact that it expressly equates Bharata and Jambudvipa. 98. The earliest cosmologies. According to the Puranas, all waters start from and return to the quadrifrontal headspring of the sacred Ganges, conceived of as high in the heavens. In the end, the indifference of the Buddhist peoples to burial in sacred rivers became so marked that Sir Monier Williams mentions it as one of the observed contrasts between Hindu and Buddhist communities. But noteworthy as are the divergences of Buddhistic cosmology from the parent system, the features common to both are still more significant. The following are some of these points of agreement, first. In each system the axis of Great Meru is the axis of the world. Second. In each the North Polar top of this indescribably glorious world mountain lifts itself to the level of the second heaven, that of Sakra, Indra. Third. In each the heaven of Yama is the third. Fourth. In the parent system the heaven of Brahma is the seventh and last, in the Buddhistic his are the seventh and all the superadded. Fifth. In each system are found the seven concentric seas, and the seven concentric lands. Sixth. In each the revolutions of the sun and moon about the earth are in a horizontal plane, one-seventh. In each, every heaven and hell and intermediate one it is not permitted to deviate the breadth of a hair from what the great Buddha, in his banner, has revealed. And especially not from his system that the sun has its horizontal course over our heads. Karatot, High Priest of Ceylon, in Drive. Edward Upper Miss Buddhism in Ceylon, London, 1829, p. 85. The Buddhistic Universe. 99. Region has a mythologic population appropriate to its biologic and other conditions, and in that population every individual is capable of reaching by processes of reincarnation any and every other place in the universe. Eighth. 
In the Buddhistic worldview, the relation of the pathless to the Narakas appears to be identical with that which we found in the Puranic teaching. Finally, in each system, the respective abodes of the gods and demons are antipodal, the one being at the North Polar summit of Meru, the other at its South Polar counterpart. One other points of agreement and divergence will doubtless occur to professional Indianists. One could myself mention others. But one think of none as important as these. The two world pictures have never been compared and contrasted with adequate care. Many years ago one conversed and corresponded with Professor Max Muller, of Oxford, on the desirableness and the promise of such a comparative study, and at one time he hoped to see it undertaken by one of his gifted pupils. Unfortunately, to this date, the desideratum remains unsupplied. Indeed, one have never seen in any tiny bare enumeration of the agreements and differences when the Asuras or deities dwell under the foundations of Mount Meru, as far underneath the surface of the earth as their great enemy Indra is above it. In short, if he may be supposed to live at the zenith, they live at the nadir, and their battlefield is on the slopes of Meru. Sir Monier Williams, Buddhism in its connection with Brahmanism and Hinduism, London, 2D ed. 1890, p. 219. 100. The earliest cosmologies, as extended as the utterly inadequate one above. May some master of Sanskrit and Pali soon give us the light and guidance needed. As to graphic representations of the Buddhist universe, two perhaps are worthy of the reader's attention, chiefly, however, because of their unlikeness not only to each other, but also to the prehistoric world picture of the ancient Babylonians. The one is found on the cover of Bieles Katina of Buddhist Scriptures, London, 1871, the other in Georgius Alphabetum Typetanum, Rome, 1762, p. 472. The unlikeness of the two is very striking. In the one, for example, the dvipas are represented as concentric circles, in the other as concentric squares. One cannot easily see how the one concept could ever have grown out of the other. On the other hand, however, it is perfectly easy to understand how both can well be variations of the one older prehistoric worldview, variations evolved in centuries of transmission. In the appendix to the present volume a paper, entitled The Madala Ablation, presents a description of the Buddhist universe in some of its more fantastic details. The contrast between the basils of these details and the profound significance of the oblation is one of the most striking things to be found in any of the ritual observances of mankind. Greater than this latter picture is reproduced in White Ellis Buddhism in Tibet, London, 1895, p. 79, and in Adolf Bastian S. I. D. Wetton, Berlin, 1893. Chapter 9 Recovered Trace of Two Lost Spheres If the Babylonian, or better, the pre-Babylonian, worldview as here understood lies back of all our oldest mythologies, it is evident that the scholars of the future have before them many and most fascinating tasks. One of these relates to the Earth's nearest neighbor world, the Moon. All modern interpreters of ancient references to the moon have gone upon the assumption that by the words the lunar sphere, or the lunar world, an ancient writer or singer always meant the moon which we see waxing and waning in the nocturnal sky. But if now, in addition to our visible moon, there was an ancient thought an invisible one, a lunar sphere a thousand times vaster, enclosing in itself the whole earth and all the clouds above and below the earth, it becomes for the interpreter of ancient literatures a most important problem to determine in every instance to which of the two lunar spheres his author in any particular expression may be referring. And, inasmuch as in this same all antedating worldview the solar sphere is immensely vaster than the sun that rises in the east and sets in the west, a parallel 101. 102. The earliest cosmologies. 
necessity arises for discriminating between these two bodies whenever we find an ancient writer making reference to the movements or domains of a solar god. No student need be told that to make the proposed discriminations, and especially to demonstrate their correctness in every instance, is not likely to prove easy. The interpretation of myths, as competent judges know, is about the most difficult and baffling of all the duties that face the investigator of antiquity. Rarely can a large group of scholars agree even as to the nature of myths in general, or as to the principles to be considered as regulative in their interpretation. The published expositions of a single myth are often so discrepant and contradictory that one feels almost ready to unite with those who pronounce all scholarly effort in this field a simple waste of time and labor. Particularly difficult is the interpretation of topographical and cosmographical myths. They reach us in forms and in mutual relations far removed from the primordial. As to possible unities of such myths, it is natural to expect to find the most elaborate and complete mythological world pictures where the mythical world rulers and world tenants are most numa minus one. A learned correspondent obligingly calls my attention to a passage in Plutarch, where in two consecutive sentences there is mention of the invisible earth enclosing lunar sphere, and of the visible earth attending moon, the passages in the explanation of the system in Isis and Osiris, 63. Trace of two lost spheres. 103. Us, that is, in systems and among peoples in which polytheism has found its completest expression. Facts justify this antecedent expectation. But as all the greatest polytheisms of antiquity seem to have included ideas and cults originally local, the world picture of each composite empire or people is at a very early time itself a composite one, a syncretistic product with indetectable variations in detail, and with indetectable blurrings in the Massachusetts. Then it is to be remembered that all the great polytheisms of the early ages were later and in some cases repeatedly subjected to the influence of profoundly pantheistic thought and teaching and, in this way, to further modification of details and to further blurring of the resulting total. That the product of such a process maintained through millenniums, as in the case of the Egyptians, should at last defy analysis as effectually as the dream of a hashish smoker, ought not to occasion surprise. Despite these considerations, however, there is a possibility that our proposed discriminations between the lunar sphere and the visible moon, and between the solar sphere and the visible sun, may prove to be of service. In any case the students of early human thought should give them a fair trial. Even in the most confused and baffling of all fields, that of the Egyptian mythology, one should be glad to see the method of attempting such discriminations. 104. The earliest cosmologies put on trial. 1. I am encouraged by the outcome of my first experiment, an attempt to deal with the problem of the location of Tut. Among Egyptologists this problem is often characterized as peculiarly difficult. As the name of some region of the world, the word Tut is found in the very oldest of Egyptian texts. As Budge correctly states, it is ordinarily translated underworld. Opposing this view, H. O. Lang says that Tut was a dark space above the stars. Renouf, on the contrary, expressly states that it was below the earth. Steindorf says, underneath the earth. Maspero, Budge, Mallet, and others assure us that in reality it was neither beneath the earth nor above it. It was an imaginary extra money region, north of the earth and on the level of the Egyptian horizon, but no part either of heaven or of the earth. No wonder that many have frankly pronounced the question insoluble, and that Budge and Steindorf expressed thy belief that the Egyptians of the historic period had themselves lost the original meaning of the term. In their descriptions of the region our highest living authorities are equally conflicting. Budge, of London, writes, through the valley of the Tut runs a river, which is the counterpart of the Nile in Egypt and of the Celestial Nile in one the asterisk is sehr schwierig, such fine rich tige forced along von der Dutzo Einachen.
H O Lang in Shintepi de la Sauce S Digin Skite D eight one S two hundred twenty two Trace of two lost spheres one hundred five Heaven, and on each bank of this river lived a vast number of monstrous beasts, and devils, and fiends of every imaginable kind and size, and among them were large numbers of evil spirits which were hostile to any being that invaded the valley. For such a region we would naturally look in one of the lowest of the hills. But if before beginning our search in the quarter we turn to Erman, of Berlin, we find the same too described in these words, a kingdom of light, the dwelling place of the gods, who traveled with the happy dead, yon those beautiful ways where the glorified travel. For such a region we would naturally look in one of the highest of the heavens. One eminent Hibbert lecturer, alluding to the toot water on which the sun god voyages the twelve hours, calls it, the heavenly river, yet on the self-same page, and only fourteen lines further on, with no apparent consciousness of the incongruity, styles it, the infernal river. Reviewing all that has been written on this topic, the student is inclined to exclaim with Shakespeare. Confusion now hath made his masterpiece. Despite all the conflicting opinions, however, there are several important points on which nearly all recent investigators now seem to agree. They may be summed up under eight. One budge elsewhere calls it the blackest hell. The Egyptian Sudan, 2, 17. 106. The earliest cosmologies. Heads, as follows, first. The nightly journey of the sun from the place of his setting to the place of his rising is neither above nor beneath the earth, yet lies in this elusive land of Tut. Second. This twelve hours journey is conceived of as in every part horizontal. Third. It is furthermore semicircular. Fourth. The movement of a bark sailing a semicircular course over water represents the Egyptian idea of this solar journey. Fifth. The water we passed over by the bark is pictured and thought as lying between two parallel mountain ranges which like semicircular walls hold the waters in their place. See fake. See on page 59 above. Sixth. During the voyage the sun god has the Egyptian earth lying some distance away on his right hand, but beyond and distinct from the more southerly of the two mountain walls which bound the waterway over which he is sailing. Seventh. The sun god does not enter the land of Tut proper immediately on sinking below the horizon of Egypt, but only after making one hour's journey and passing through the nearer of the two parallel semicircular mountain ranges, one in like manner the twelfth hour of the voyage is not in Tut proper, but is spent in passing from Tut proper to the eastern horizon of Egypt. 2 eighth. During the voyage. 1. Mespera gives the technical name of the opening in the mountain and translates it the slit. Elsewhere he calls it the mouth of the cleft. 2. This passage from Tut to Baka is represented as serpentine in a very peculiar sense. Twelve gods tow the boat, not over a river, or Trace of two lost spheres 107 In Tut proper the sun god has personal intercourse with both gods and demons. Eureka the tooth problem is solved. The solution must already be clear to every careful reader. Turn to the diagram of the Babylonian or pre-Babylonian worldview. In it the nocturnal path of the sun answers to every requirement, one. It is neither under the earth, nor yet above it. Two. It is in every part horizontal. Three. It is semicircular. 4. 
Movement on it is like that of a bark sailing a semicircular course over water. 5. The concentric solar and lunar spheres, or rather the portions from the west point around northward to the east point, give us the two parallel mountain ranges of the Egyptian picture. 6. As during the voyage Ra has the Egyptian, so Shamash has the Babylonian earth lying at some distance away on the right hand, but beyond and distinct from the more southerly of the two mountain walls which bound the waterway over which he is sailing. 7. Observing daily that the sun god Estejumi was in a wholly different plane from that of the supposed night journey, the Egyptians seem not unnaturally to have imagined that he required an hour after sinking below the western hills to get back into Tut, and again an hour in the morning to make his over a serpent a serpent, but completely for a serpent. Budge, 1, 257. Silenzoni, Dizionario, Tav. Vai. E. Amblino agrees with Budge that the passage is through the serpent and not along his back. Ftaidiv with story of the religions, Tom Lai, P. 26, 27. 108. The earliest cosmologies. Way from beyond the lunar sphere to the eastern horizon of the dwellers upon the Nile. 8. Finally, to being originally the space between the invisible lunar and solar spheres, and the nightly journey of the sun god being in the equatorial or approximately equatorial plane which divides all the heavens from all the hells, the student should expect to find precisely what we do find, namely, that on the journey the solar god personally communicates as freely with gods as with demons, and with demons as with gods. Lost toot, or at least the best known part thereof, is certainly found. With it we recover, in the semicircular mountain ranges, the indubitable trace of two lost spheres. Would we see them as figured at one period upon the monuments, we have only to turn to the oft-reproduced cut given on page 211 of Brugges' religion and mythology der Alten Egypter. One the Egyptian pictures of the nocturnal voyage of their sun god, Ra, recalled to the memory of every reader of the classics the corresponding Greek myth of the cup, a coracle, in which Helios was represented as each night making the same semicircular passage on the surface of the ocean stream. C-Rap and Rosher S. Lexicon, 1, 2, SB. 2014. Very likely the sunboat in this case was called a cup because those among whom the myth originated were familiar with the Kufa, or ordinary small riverboat of the Tigris and Euphrates, which was in the form Kiesia Bowl. Seacut and Rawlinson S. Herodotes, 1, 260. Referring to Burke, Jarb. Fur Philology, 1860, p. 389 and Kuhn in his Zeitschrift, 1, 536, Rap correctly remarks, Der Okeanos in Welchen der Sonnenbecker dahin schwimmt, ist der Spreiglich der Wolkenhimmel. The Anschränkung seiner Wort auf die Nächte sieht nur die Folge der Anschlusses und die Erdische Lokalis around the Okeanos und der Einfügung dieses Alten Mythos in der Anderen, Sean and Wachelter and Vostelungen. Chapter 10 Points and Problems for Future Study in the foregoing chapters we have seen not a little evidence that in countries widely separated the earliest traceable teachers held and taught what was essentially one and the same world concept. This included appropriate local abodes for gods and demons, for living men and for dead. It grouped these several abodes into one all-inclusive geocentric, upright axled, polyuranian cosmos. In the land in which we can study the system to the best advantage, it presents two earths adjusted base to base, the upper the abode of living men. The under, its inverted counterpart, the abode of the dead. To the seven planetary divinities it gives seven distinct concentric spheres, to a new and an eighth, outermost in position, all including, beside a real sphere. When the upper half of the thus constituted universe is compared with the under, the symmetry of all the included parts and dimensions is seen to be as complete and admirable as it is striking. Now, minds capable of originating, 
or even of handing down from generation to generation, a mental world picture of such remarkable unity, complexity, and balance as this cannot 109. 110. The earliest cosmologies have failed to go farther, cannot have failed to inquire how the constituent parts of this stupendous system were related to each other in effecting, or in regulating, the orderly ongoings of the whole. The diurnal movements of the sun, moon, and stars would of necessity call out at least crude attempts at explanation. So also the rising mists and falling rain. So also the alternate growth and decay of the earth as verdure, the birth and death of human beings. If night and day are seen to be ever chasing each other, the parts of the universe alternately darkened and illuminated must be so adjusted in the observer as thought as at least to render possible such incessant alternations. If mists rise and rains fall, cloudland and the land rained upon must be set in some relation by every perceiver of the facts. No proof is needed for the statement that if any man as universe includes distinct abodes for the living and the dead, it will also include some idea of the way in which the no longer living make their passage from the one abode to the other. To a thoughtful person few things can be more impressive than the ways in which prehistoric men attempted to represent, and to render rationally coherent, the ongoings of the universe. These attempts reach us chiefly, of course, in the form of myths. In any form they are exceedingly precious. For they give us our only knowledge of the earliest efforts of our Problems for Future Study 111 Race to construct what we moderns call a philosophy of nature. To call them mythical in no wise invalidates their claim to attentive study. The nebula hypothesis of Kant will become essentially a myth if, as an interesting and almost poetic speculation, it shall come to be handed down long generations after a more adequate view of the origin of the solar system has been discovered. If research hypothesis for the explanation of a natural phenomenon is primarily an exercise of the imagination at the instigation of reason, and in the mythopoeic stage of culture is sure to take on a mythologic form in its expression, one to one. The assumptions of the savant are hypotheses, those of the savage are called myths. Frank B. Devins, An Introduction to the History of Religion, p. 32. Wilhelm Bender, Die Einste Hung der Dedanschingen im Präkischen Alsertum, Stuttgart, 1899, p. 56. 2. Even as sober and severely scientific a writer as Professor E. B. Tyler emphasizes this relation between mythic form and scientific content in nature tales told among peoples of meager culture. In one place he says, the savage names and stories of the stars and constellations may seem at first but childish and purposeless fancies. But it always happens, in the study of the lower races, that the more means we have of understanding their thoughts, the more sense and reason do we find in them. The Aborigines of Australia say that Uri and Wanjal, who are the stars we call Castor and Pollux, pursue Pura the kangaroo, our capella, and kill him at the beginning of the great heat, and the mirage is the smoke of the fire they roast him by. They say also that Marpian Kirk and Niloan, Arcturus and Lyra, were the discoverers of the ant pupas and the eggs of the lone bird, and taught the Aborigines to find them for food. Translated into the language of fact, these simple myths record the summer place of the stars in question, and the seasons of ant pupas and lone eggs, which seasons are marked by the stars who are called their discoverers. Primitive Culture 1, 357 As the Aborigines of Australia are commonly referred to as the very lowest specimens of our race, this evidence of their habitual recognition of individual stars by name, and this illustration of their ability to determine the seasons by astronomic changes occurring in the progress of the 112. The earliest cosmologies. We call these prehistoric myths fanciful and hard to understand. So there. But in the infancy of language every originator of a new thought had also to invent terms for its expression. 
How can we wonder if in multitudes of cases the terms seized upon were symbolic, pictographic, or even poetically suggestive merely? The time for matching mental concepts with polytechnically accurate and adequate expressions had not yet come. Can we say that it has yet come? Again, we are told that these prehistoric myths are inconsistent with each other. There. But our latest scientists rarely present us pictures of complex holes without seeming equally inconsistent. Here are three elaborately colored drawings, representing obviously a human body. They are from a new up-to-date atlas for students of human anatomy. One and the same face appears in each of the three pictures, but in all other parts they are utterly unlike. A child, or a Zulu, might imagine them to represent what men of three different races, or world periods, believed to be the contents of the human frame. So thinking, he might well wonder at the utter lack of agreement. Very likely he would infer from the contrariety of the representations that all were alike worthier, or certainly very interesting. Too few ethnologists write as if they had discovered what Tyler says always happens in the study of the lower races. Problems for future study 113 Less The deficiency would lie in the interpreter. In reality, there is no contrariety whatever in the three chromographs. The first represents the muscular, the second the vascular, and the third the nervous system of the human body. Precisely so, three myth pictures of one and the same part or process of the universe may seem to us confused and inconsistent, when in reality all the confusion or inconsistency arises from our own failure to keep distinct such easily distinguishable world concepts as the mechanical, the biological, and the personal. For example, in the mechanical, the axis of the universe may be pictured, as Plato pictures it, as the spindle of necessity, the lifeless support of the whirling whirls of the heavens. In the biologic world picture, however, the same world axis is no longer lifeless, it is an ever-living oak trunk, equipped with wings for self-rotation, the vital support of world-filling branches, the whole covered and adorned with the starry peplos of harmonia. Finally, in the picture in which the universe is considered mainly significant because a universe of persons, the oak and tree trunk of the biologic worldview becomes the columnar bridge on which, as described in the vision of a, the souls of the redeemed escape from our realms of sin and death, and gain the imperishable abode of the God of Gods. All these conceptions of the axial line of the heavens and earth lay in Plato's. 114. The earliest cosmologies. Mind with as little of contrariety or mutual inconsistency as lie the three anatomical chromographs in the mind of the teacher who drew them. A lifetime could be spent in the one task of investigating the symbolic and poetic forms in which early peoples, and peoples of a later date, have expressed and expressed this fundamental idea of the world axis. Though not a mythologist by calling, one many years ago printed a study in which the world tree symbol of the universe was traced through twelve mythologies. The idea was found to be pre-Babylonian. The study further showed that sometimes, in place of the spindle of necessity, we have a lance, or an arrow, or a spear, on which the heavens revolve. In the Vedas, it is an imperishable axle, on which without intermission celestial and terrestrial wheels are forever turning. Again, as in several mythologies, the columnar bridge is pictured as a ladder, with seven, or eight, significant step supports. In Burmese thought and imagery it is the umbrella staff of universe sovereignty. The variety of the symbols is apparently without limit. In a work of amazing erudition, filling more than a thousand closely printed octavo pages, the late John O'Neill has claimed, and in the opinion of not a few has shown, that every known mythology is full of symbols and stories of this all-sustaining, all. Problems for future study 115. Unifying universe axis, and of the rotary world movement centering about it, 1. 
Another lifetime could be spent in investigating in ancient mythologies what we may call the vascular, a circulatory, system of the universe. That all waters, celestial, terrestrial, and subterrestrial, belong to one system of flowing and reflowing streams is taught in every ancient mythology. That all these streams proceed from, and return to, one and the same celestial head spring is asserted or implied in so many that the investigator may safely consider this idea to have constituted a feature of whatever worldview antedated the ancient cosmologies that have reached us. In a study on this subject printed in the year 1885, evidences pointing to this peculiar feature were brought together from Vedic and Avestan sources, evidences so clear as to satisfy Professor Spiegel that both the Indian and Iranian Aryans prehistorically held and taught it. In the same paper clues were given going to show that the same idea was shared by the Northmen, by medieval Christian teachers, by the Finns, the Sabines, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and even by the pre-Babylonian one the work is entitled The Night of the Gods, An Inquiry into Cosmic and Cosmogonic Mythology and Symbolism, London, Vol. 1, 1893. Vol. 2, 1897. In the last two or three years of his life one received from this too early lost friend many letters, in one of which he was kind enough to say that but for my published researches the work above named would never have been written. 116. The Earliest Cosmologies Akkadah Sumerians in the Rig Veda and in Homer, in the Puranas of India and the Suttas of China, the headspring itself is a fons quadritrons, that is to say, a four-faced world fount, whose waters simultaneously pour forth eastwardly, westwardly, northwardly, southwardly, for the watering of the whole earth. One but in any universe as complete and balanced as seems to have existed in the minds of prehistoric men, there must have been not only room and adjustments for the distribution of light and the circulation of the waters, but also recognized ways in which on proper occasions the tenanting intelligences could have intercourse with each other. Gods in widely separated domiciles and jurisdictions must have had appropriate highways for their chariots when paying visits of ceremony one to another, or when summoned to attend one of those stated pan-Iranian parliaments or consultation assemblies for which every polytheism provides. Moreover, gods and men being children of a common sire, and the latter children dependent upon the former, no gulf between them must be impassable. We read of a fabled eagle bearing an Atana or a Ganymede, from earth one von der rich to Kitira and site to Badas Alten Dish und Altiranisch Wasser System Binich Volkommen Ibrazot. Hef Spiegel, in a letter to the author. In one of the apocryphal gospels the quadrifrontal world fount is located in the fourth heaven, and its four streams are milk and honey, oil and wine. The same idea is expressed in the Slavonic Book of Enoch. Problems for Future Stud 117 To Heaven Wood form instance is so avowedly exceptional as these we give no light upon provisions conceived of as originally and permanently included in the cosmic structure itself and thought of as expressly designed to facilitate intercourse between terranean and subterranean beings, or between the celestial and counter-celestial. What in the oldest cosmological thought were the permanent structural provisions of this kind, if such existed? The answering of this question must be left to the scholars of the future. My own studies on this point have not been extensive, but so far as they have gone they have resulted in a strong conviction that the main highway from heaven to heaven and from underworld to underworld was along the central axis line of the total universe. Precisely there we should expect to find it. There alone could it stretch through the mundane immensities forever unaffected by the whirling spheres. There alone could it enter and pass through the throne city of every world and directly link all to each and each to all. So conceived, it's one a decidedly hopeful prospect of new progress in these studies is opened up by the establishment at Berlin of the new Gesellschaft for Verblichen Mythology, and the starting of its Mythologicious Bibliothek, Leap. 1907 
also by the recent issue of works more or less cosmological from the pens of Georg C. H. Lessman, G. Heising, Bruno Bunch, C. Fries, A. Doring, Ditlef Nielsen, F. 10. Kubler, F. K. Ginzel, and Johann Lepsius, all of whom give evidence of a wholesome dissatisfaction with the principles of interpretation long dominant in this field. 118. The earliest cosmologies. Upper section, the path of the divas, is identical with the pre-Babylonian way of Anu. To reach it from the abodes of living men, beings possessing weight must needs have a support for their ascending feet. Hence columnar bridges like the Chinvat of the Persians. Heaven ladders like the Egyptian. Terraced mountains like those of the Euphratian peoples. On the other hand, beings at the top of the heavenly way, having no weight, were not thought to need any such solid supports in making a descent. Hence in Platonic, Neoplatonic, Gnostic, and Sabine thought, souls, descending from the highest sphere for incarnation through human birth, have need of nothing more than obstructionless polar openings in the crystalline planetary spheres to enable them to pass the seven, and to reach the earth. But while this axial highway from world to world was incomparably the most important in the universe, movements and paths on the surface of each of the spheres were, of course, conceivable. In mythologies built upon or including the idea of transmigration, one of these conceivable paths is particularly interesting since it provides a way by which a return from the land of the dead to the land of the living is possible, and this without retracing the path by which the ghost descended to the land of the dead. In Indian mythology, for example. Problems for future study. 119. The descent, 12 days in duration slash is supposed to be along the surface of the earth, southward, and across the ocean, into the transoceanic underworld. It is conceivable that a return is supposed possible by a path up the interior surface of the earth enclosing lunar sphere. At this thought and the later confused and confusing Upanishad passages referred to below, there may easily have been connected with it the further idea that the perpetually reascending souls which again and ever again are rained down from the zenith of the earth enclosing lunar sphere are thus doomed to successive rebirths because as yet imperfectly purified, and that only by passing the Hadean gate that gives access to the exterior surface of the first of the heavenly spheres, this lunar one, and by ascending a path upon its exterior, one can successfully reach the door that leads to the higher heavens. One to one other structural feature in this most ancient world concept will surely challenge and receive the attention of future students of the prehistoric past. One allude to the zodiac, the most precious if not the oldest scientific heirloom of the human race, free the axial world. 1. L. On fear, review D1 Histoire de Religions, FF, 302. 2. Kashtaki Upanishad, 1, 2, 6, Sacred Books of the East Vol. 1, P. 273, 279. See also the reference to the path of the Divas and the path of the Pitras in the Kandoji Upanishad, if, 15, 5, in same volume, P. Eighty and note on P. Eighty-two, eighty-three. Asterisk treating of the origin of the zodiac in a recent article, Edward Walter Munder, F. R. A. S. Superintendent of the Solar Department, Royal. One hundred twenty. The earliest cosmologies. Pillar idea associated in our minds with the name of Atlas, is no doubt of equal antiquity, possibly of greater. But it cannot compare in significance with the twelve signed zodiac. As soon as a man can mentally picture a circle he has the idea of a center. And as soon as the revolving sky suggests to his mind a sphere he has the idea of an axis. But to create the zodiac required a far higher power of thought, and a vastly greater attainment in the knowledge of the stars and in mathematics. 
It is a perfect instrument for the measurement of astronomic ages. No modem has ever suggested a substitute for it, or made any improvement in it. But had it as yet never been thought of, few persons now living in any one of our most civilized nations would be likely to invent it. How many would feel any need for such an Ionian timepiece? How many, feeling the need, would be likely to hit upon this simple yet an improbably perfect answer to the need? What learned and ingenious reader of this sentence believes that, if uninformed as to any previous effort in this line on the part of earlier observatory at Greenwich, expresses admiration of the giant among men who first recognized that the visible sun is daily moving among the invisible stars. He says, this, perhaps, was the most difficult discovery which up to the present date has been made in astronomy. It was the first great incursion of physical research into the invisible, the first great triumph of induction, the first time that appearances were put aside in favor of thought. Little a slaving age, vol. 227 p. 618. Writing of this triumph of mind, Newcomb says, it may be considered the birth of astronomic science. Popular Astronomy, p. 16. Problems for Future Study 121. Med, he himself would have been the first to chart out the ecliptical zone of the heavens, defining within it the lunar mansions and the solar stations, backgrounding all with a sexagesimally divided and subdivided scale of 12 equal parts, on which the minutes of the progress of every planet, and the ages of the precession of the equinoxes, could be measured each with equal ease and both with absolute accuracy. Of the prehistoric man or men who really invented this ingenious chronometer nothing is known. No branch of the human family has a tradition determining even the millennium of its first introduction. As yet the savants who have busied themselves with the problem have given us no trustworthy result. As early as 1754, Neubrenner, in Germany, raised the question, one forty years later a distinguished French astronomer, Dupuis, working upon Egyptian data, convinced himself that the zodiac was invented, years before his time. In 1872, however, an American astronomer, Professor John Brocklesby, assured us with great positiveness that the zodiac was constructed about, years ago. His exact date was, years before the time of his writing, which would give us the year 277 BC. His argument was simply that, at the start, the signs doubtless corresponded in position with their constellation slash and that the one in his dissertation De Inventoribus Zodiaci. 122. The earliest cosmologies. Only time within the range of history when this occurred was between B.C. 200 and B.C. 300. Three years, however, after this settlement of the case, a learned professor at Leiden, Holland, employing Chinese data, announced that the zodiac had been in use in China as early as B.C. 18,716.2 Only one year after this an American scholar gave us his solution, years ago. Within the next 12 months the English astronomer, Richard A. Proctor, published a paper favoring B.C. 2170 as the desired date. Amid such disagreements, the prospect is not encouraging, for one thing only seems growing more and more certain, and that is that if Brockless B.S. fundamental proposition is correct, and if accordingly, at the start, the signs corresponded in position with their respective constellations, we must go back of his date about years. For, according to what is now known of Babylonian astronomy, the zodiac was certainly in use many centuries before the correspondence of signs and constellations in the third pre-Christian century, 5. One Elements of Astronomy, New York, 1872. A. G. Schlegel, Uranography Chinoise, La Haye, 1875. D. Miller, Harmode, Latest Ed. North Adams, Massachusetts.
1892. The most recent estimates one have noticed are those of E. W. Maunder, Bob, Pitt, B. 619 and E. M. Plunkett, Ancient Calendars and Constellations, London, 1903. According to the former, the zodiac dates from circa 300 B.C. According to the latter, from circa 600 B.C. J. F. Hewitt, however, in his History and Chronology of the Myth-Making Age, London, 1902, gives us the true date, B.C. 14200. Asterisk. Referring to the astronomical researches of Epping and Strassmayer, Sace, Oppert, Mayer, Muller, Jensen, Lehman, and others, a writer just referred to, Plunkett, remarks, whatever else remains uncertain. Problems for future study 123 Such oscillations and estimates of the date of the invention remind one of the Ionian oscillations reported by astronomers in the angle of the inclination of the zodiac to the celestial equator. The former, however, lack the determinability, the moderate limits, and the indescribable stateliness of the astronomic movement, won a final inquiry. Few readers can have reached the present page without having repeatedly and earnestly asked themselves, where was originated this unique, this widespread, almost ecumenical, pre-Babylonian conception of the universe. In what line can our heliobulial ancestors, as the current anthropology calls them, have so far lifted their thoughts from the gathering of nuts and edible roots for daily food as to feel an intellectual interest in the far-off astral world, and because of this and open to discussion, some facts are clearly established. We now know that the inhabitants of Babylonia, in a remote age, certainly as early as the 4th millennium B.C., were acquainted with the 12 divisions of the zodiac, and that these divisions were imagined under figures closely resembling in almost every instance those now depicted on our celestial globes. Similarly, Master of Arts Quentin, in the Revue des Vestures des Religions, Mars Avril, 1895, p. 169 fe, places the invention more than 4000 b.c. The contributions of Professors Hommel and Winkler in the Babylonian field are very important. In the Greek field no work is perhaps more authoritative at this date than Professor Franz Boll Esfera. A worthy geographical counterpart is E. Hugo Berger as Jeschichi der Wissenschaftlichen Erdkund der Griechen, too awful. Leipzig, 1903. According to Lagrange this angle was at its maximum, 2930 B.C. 29400 It then decreased to a minimum, 2120 A.B.C. 14400 Then increased to a new maximum, 2353 A in B.C. 2000 its next minimum, 2254A, will be Anno Domini 6600. Its next maximum, 2521A, in Anno Domini 19300. Many and great are the advantages of the astronomer over the archaeologist. He can not only unveil the past, but also foretell the future. 124. The earliest cosmologies. Interest proceeded to distinguish the planets from the stars that never wander, and, most remarkable of all, to invent that zodiacal chronometer whose months are double millenniums and whose year is more than, of our years. One of the most eminent of living astronomers, Munda, of the Royal Observatory at Greenwich, following the same line of evidence as Proctor, and before him Schwartz, reaches the conclusion they reached, to wit, that the terrestrial standpoint of the astronomers who framed our constellations and mapped the zodiac cannot have been in Babylonia, or in Egypt, or in Arabia, or in India. He further says that probably we are warranted in excluding from our search Greece, Italy, and Spain, one if not in any of these seats of ancient culture, where can that primeval standpoint have been? One believe the true answer to this question is now attainable.
The region 1 I am about to suggest is equidistant from India, Babylonia, and Egypt. From each of these, however, it widely differs. It is Chi, Walter Maunder, in Little S Living Age, Vol. 227, p. 61411. The present writer was in the midst of an interesting correspondence with Mr. Proctor at the time of his sudden and widely lamented death. That the constellations associated by him with the flood tradition were outlined and named at the time and place supposed by him, and by Maunder, is far from incredible. But both the interest in astral worlds, and the proficiency in stellar studies manifested in the conception and construction of such a star story of the deluge, require for their rational explanation a liberal allowance of antecedent time and a place more signally adapted than Cappadocia, or any other part of Asia Minor, to draw menace thoughts to heaven. Problems for Future Study 125 More favorable for astronomic observation and for astronomic experiment than any one of the three. Indeed, no other land was so fitted to become the birthplace of the science. It is a region in which the movements of the heavenly bodies can be watched through unusually protracted periods, without interruption, and under cosmical conditions more favorable than any that our modern astronomers have known. Especially does its center over an astronomic viewpoint superior in several respects to any to be found on the banks of the Euphrates or in the basin of the Mediterranean. Men their domiciled would need no careful measurements or logarithmic calculations to determine solstice or equinox, each would be as visibly fixed and dated as are with us the noon and the sunset. At the center there is but one sunrise and one sunset in the whole long year. Strange as this arrangement would seem to us were we translocated to that latitude, our wonder would be increased on finding that by a short march of less than five miles we could reach a new camping ground distinguished from the first by having annually two sunrises and two sunsets. Nor would our wonder fail to grow on finding that with every farther march the same distance southward we would find camping grounds having an additional annual sunrise and sunset until, after more than three and a half hundred such marches, we reached a charmed circle B. 126. The Earliest Cosmologies Yond which, however far we journeyed, we could find but 365 such annual apparitions and vanishings of the orb of day. Now it is on, and within, the charmed circle enclosing these ever-increasing and decreasing dawns and nightfalls that the starry realms can be studied as nowhere else. On it, an observer whose zenith is 47Q from the pole of the ecliptic soon finds his observatory obligingly wheeled into a position where zenith and pole are absolutely coincident. This pleasing transportation poleward or the reverse completes itself every 12 hours, and by no mechanism of the observatory or effort of the observer. The parallaxes and sky tiltings obtainable in these ever-recurring circuits can nowhere else be had. Then, Farther within the circle, a heavenly body can be watched and studied months at a time. Star paths which we at present can trace but a night, and through but a minute fraction of an unknown arc, can there be followed through their completed circuits, and this without one hour of interruption. There the problem of the identity or non-identity of the morning and evening star has never arisen. There no commentator on ancient poets has ever had excuse for getting confused over the eastern and western palaces of the sun. There all stars along the celestial equator can be correlated to corresponding points on the terrestrial horizon of the observer, or at his pleasure tilted to a. Problems for future study 127 Different plane there the sphericity of the Earth, and the inclination of its axis, would be easily discoverable, one so also the dependence of the Moon upon the Sun for her illumination. So also the rationale of an eclipse. 
They're more naturally than anywhere else could men come to think of the azure sky as an ever-moving, earth-encircling ocean stream, on whose level waters the sun and moon and stars were sailing, to there, and nowhere else, the observer is at the top of an earth that never rolls over, and under a zenith that never passes to its setting. 3. The country's center is the Arctic Pole, its boundaries the Arctic Circle. Years ago one called it the one natural astronomic observatory of the whole Earth, and the more one have studied the astronomic attainments and worldviews of prehistoric men, the more certain it has seemed to me that here, in this upright axled country, was originated this upright axled cosmology of the oldest culture peoples. The progress of a light conviction in the wide. 1. The chain do not beds of the heavens during a temple walk in a straight line from any point a few miles distant from the pole to a point at more distant beyond the pole would suggest the true vigor of the earth, and what while now furnish an ocular demonstration of the ancient doctrine that the celestial sphere was centered above a fixed terrestrial one. Even the slow movement of the celestial pole around the unchanging pole of the ecliptic, and the consequent precession of the equinoxes, both known to the Babylonians, could have been first discovered in the Arctic regions far more easily, one would think, than in Babylonia. 2. See Berger, Mythisch Kosmographie der Griechen, 1904, p. 2. 3. For this reason it is the only place where the heaven ladders and columnar bridges of all mythologies can permanently and uninterruptedly connect our earth with the heavens above it. See the Cradle of the Human Race, p. 144, 145, and Passim. 128. The Earliest Cosmologies World of scholarship may be slow, but it is remarkably steady. One already in the 18th century Jean Sylvain Bailey, an astronomer of first rank, reached the well-reasoned conclusion that the genesis of his science was in the highest north. Buffon, a genius of the same generation, demonstrated that in the slow cooling of the earth in early ages the first portions of its surface to become habitable by men must have been at the poles. Two or three generations later biology independently reached the conviction that the dominant floral and faunal forms of the whole earth had their origin in the Paleoarctic zone. To about the same time ethnologists began to suggest or to assert the Arctic origin of the human family, three even authors from whom such a doctrine was by no means looked for found reason for professing their belief that the human species originated in the polar world, for comparative philology has. 1. See my paper on the cradle of the human race, recent literature, in the Methodist Review, New York, December, 1908. 2. Chris, Mittelingen der Wiener Anthropologischen Gesellschaft, N. F. FY, 1, 1898. Eminent pioneers in this scientific advance were Asa Gray, Oswald Heer, A. Penck, Otto Kuntz, and Joseph Leconte. C. James Orton, Comparative Zoology, P. 384. Also, G. Hilton Scribner, Where Did Life Begin? New York, 2D ed. 1903. 3. Quatrefages, The Human Species, New York, 1879, p. 178. Moritz Wagner, Ursprung und Heimat der Menschen, Basel, 1889. M. La Marquis G. The supporter, How the Earth Was Peopled, in the Popular Science Monthly, New York, 1884, translated from the Revue des Deux Mondes. 4. Giulio Lazzarini, Etnica Razionale, Pavia, 1890. In June, 1884, and again in December, 1891, in the pages of Lanuova Cienza R. Orn, the editor, Thrive. Enrico Caporali, supported this view of the cradle land of the race. Problems for future study 129 increasingly turned its eyes in the same direction for light upon its problems. Comparative mythology, through Indian investigators in the East, 1-2 and Celtic in the West, 
free asterisk and Teutonic in the center slash is more and more pointing with converging fingers toward a Protarian homeland within the Arctic Circle. 5. Anthropology, in the person of some of its most authoritative representatives, is 2. Day teaching, with a positiveness of conviction hitherto unequaled, that the real cradle land of the whole human family, and the center of its original dispersion, must be sought in Arctoga slash a North Polar country which no foot of man shall ever again tread, a land covered with everlasting ice, a submerged beneath the billows of the ocean. Registered even the biblical theologians have come to see that the Eden story of Genesis, when rightly. 1 A. R. Burton, Etima Latina, London, 1890. 2 by Gunga Tillich, The Arctic Home in the Vedas, Bombay, 1903, Itvo, he. Exeve, 504. This author is a native Sanskrit scholar who long resisted the view to which, as here shown, his mature studies have led him. Principal John Rees, Professor of Celtic in the University of Oxford, Origin and Growth of Religion as Illustrated by Celtic Heath Endham, Hibbert Lectures, London, 1888. In any case, the mythological indications to which your attention has been called, point, if one am not mistaken, to some spot within the Arctic Circle, key. 636. Asterisk. Ernst Cross, Tuskeland, Derarishen Stam und Gotter Heimat, Gloga, 1891, Itvo, he. Over 600. Noticed by Rudolf Virchow and Z. Schrift for Ethnology, Heft 3, 1891. Two years later, Drive. Cross published a supplementary volume, Die Trojebergen Nordeuropas, Gloga, Itvo, he. Kokexai, 300. His Allgemeine Weltanschauung and Era Historischen in Twickling, Stuttgart, 1889, one have not seen. J. D. Ludwig Wilse, Herkunft der Geschichte der Rehr, 1899. Wilse, Menschwording, Stuttgart, 1907, p. 11, 13, 15, 72, 107 FE. Also the authors quoted by him in his Tierwelt und Erdelter, 1908, and in his treatise, Die Urheimat de Menschekleks, Heidelberg, 1905. 130. The earliest cosmologies. Interpreted, is the story of a polar paradise, the headspring of whose four rivers is in the upper heavens. At no distant day, comparative cosmology, youngest of all these lines of scientific research, is certain to bring in her slowly and carefully gathered testimony. And we may rest assured that this testimony will be found to be in full accord with that of her tributary sciences. 1 Hermann Gunkel, Genesis Ubersetzt und der Clark, Cottingen, 1901, p. 33. T. K. Chain, Traditions and Beliefs of Ancient Israel, London, 1907, p. 84, 455. Gunkel expressly equates der Gottsgarten, der Gottsberg, Eden, and der Nordpol de Himmels. See also Alfred Jeremias. Das Alte Testament im Licht de Alten Orients, too awful. S. 188, 202, for approximations to this view. Since the foregoing was put in type Wilser, in an article entitled Der Nordische Schopfenschert, printed in the Zeitschrift für den Ausbeider Eniwicklingslings, Heft 5, 1909, has given an instructive summary of the entire literature of this anthropological doctrine, including even my article in the Methodist Review for November, 1908. Appendix Page 1 The Model Ablation
133. Paper read before a private club of clergymen, March 4, 1897. 2. Homer's abode of the dead. One hundred fifty seven. Printed in the Boston University Yearbook. Vol. X, eighteen eighty three. Three. Homer S. Abode of the Living. One hundred seventy eight. Printed in the Boston University Yearbook, Vol. She. Four. The Gates of Sunrise in the Oldest Mythologies. One hundred ninety two. Printed in the Babylonian and Oriental Record, London, Vol. Three, eighteen eighty nine. Five. The homeland of the Gandharvas.
197. Prepared for annual meeting, American Oriental Society, 1906. 6. The World Tree of the Teutons. Two hundred. Printed in the Monist, Chicago, January, 1907. 7. Problems still unsolved in Indo-Aryan cosmology. 205 printed in the Journal of the American Oriental Society, 1905. V. Index of Authors.